Bye.
Yeah.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jeanette Schnars. I'm the executive director of the Regional Science Consortium, and thank you for coming out today. I appreciate it. Um, this is our final day of the symposium, so we've had a full couple days thus far, lots of good talks, a wonderful poster session, and we have a full day of talks today, followed by our student awards this afternoon, so thank you for being here. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and get started with our first talk. So Matt Finkenbinder from Wilkes University will be our first speaker. All right, thank you, Jeanette. Um, so happy to be here. Um, this project has kind of been in the works for a couple years. Um, this started um, during COVID, so we had uh, lots of sort of fits and delays and being stuck in our basement for a while. So it's good to be out and about and talk about this. 
Um, the, this project really came about from a couple things. So uh, first off, my failure at uh, steelhead fishing. I don't like crowds, but I like fishing. And um, I wound up at the mouth of Elk Creek. I hiked along the bluffs. I saw amazing till deposits and uh, lake sediments. I'm a sedimentologist, and so all of this was extremely interesting to me. And uh, then I got a grant funded. And so I wrote an instrumentation grant. I got a laser diffraction analyzer and a Rotap sieve shaker. And this uh, project was really um, a vehicle to test out these equipment and to learn how to use the equipment. So uh, we are here evaluating grain size analysis methods for beach and dune sands along the Lake Erie shoreline. This is a picture of the bluffs. That's uh, my two students, Erica and Jess, uh, which were undergraduate environmental science students at Wilkes that worked on this project. All right, so at the outset, I want to thank all of these people, mostly Jess and Erica, who did lots of grain size analysis work. Uh, and then funding for the instrumentation came from the George Alden Trust and the Wilkes Mentoring Committee. And I have to acknowledge Jack Hill, who's at DCNR. Um, he rapidly approves all of my state park permits, and so uh, that's a really nice thing. Uh, Sorry? Oh. OK. Gotcha. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about textural properties of sediments. Uh, how many geologists, environmental scientists out there? Okay, so uh, biologists, I assume more biologists. So just a brief primer on some sedimentology. So grain size is a fundamental parameter uh, that we use to describe loose sediments. And we quantify this using this scale. This is called the Uden wetworth scale from 1922. It was good back then. We still use it. So we divide um, uh, sediments into four size classes uh, based on the SI um, division, the, the diameter of the particles. So clay are the smallest, then we have silt, then sand, and gravel. And each of those is further subdivided into subclasses. The focus here is on sand, and so sand is between 63 microns and 2,000 microns, or 2 millimeters in size. And we uh, subdivide that into very fine, fine, medium, coarse, and coarse sand. We're also going to use uh, a logarithmic transformation of those SI units. That's called the phi grain size scale. So to calculate phi values, we take the negative log base 2 of the diameter of the millimeter size. And this is useful for what's called graphical plotting. We can plot really um, big or wide grain size data. And by log transforming it, this helps us kind of assess the modality of the samples um, in an easier way. So uh, the basal boundary of sand is 63 microns. That is 4 phi. And then the upper boundary is 2,000 microns, or 2 millimeters, and that's negative 1 phi. The way this works is, as you either increase uh, or decrease the phi value by 1, that either is a doubling or halving of the corresponding SI value. OK. So why or what is grain size? Why does it matter? So in most sedimentary systems, this is related to the energy of the transport or deposition. So coarse grains tend to deposit in high energy settings, like let's say big um, high energy beaches or lots of waves, whereas low energy settings, like let's say a deep lake, are much more fine grained in comparison. <laughs> That's just kind of shown here. Again, this is a representation of that grain size scale with the energy over here on the right-hand side. So we always measure this. In addition, we also quantify a related parameter, and that's called sorting. Sorting is the range in grain sizes across the mean or the spread across the mean. And mathematically, this is the standard deviation of the grain size distribution data. So we classify it as either uh, very well sorted, which is all the same size, or on the opposite side, then we have very poorly sorted, which is like clay, silt, sand, and gravel. And the main control on sorting is the transport mechanism. So whether it's fluvial, glacial, aeolian, or landslides, or wave action, each of these has different sorting characteristics. So, going to have myself here, but here are pictures of those environments. And so sediment is weathered on land. It is moved by uh, various processes. So for example, we've got the action of flowing water, fluvial processes, the most common on Earth's surface, glacial transport, uh, dunes, or aeolian transport. And then once in the ocean, we have wave action and tide action. 
And each of these uh, transport mechanisms and uh, sites has different energies. And because of that, the sediments have, they tend to have unique textural properties. And so grain size and the degree of sorting. All right, so what this graph shows is a biplot of mean grain size in the x-axis, and then we have sorting in the y-axis. And so these are in fee values, um, which is a bit funky, but four fee again uh, would be uh, 63 microns, and then zero fee over by the origin would be uh, one millimeter. So dunes plot over here between two and four, which is fine to very fine sand, and also low on the sorting, those are very well sorted. On the upper left then, we have the point bar fluvial samples. Those are coarser grained and they are less well sorted. In the middle, we have the, uh, the beach samples, which are made by wave action. So they have intermediate grain size and sorting characteristics. This is a global average data set. What you will see later is that Presque Isle samples don't make any sense. I haven't made sense of them yet, I should say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so grain size analysis methods. So we use three methods here, visual inspection, we take a binocular scope, we use a grain size comparator chart at top right. Then we use these two new things, so sieving, which is using this Rotap sieve shaker and a series of nested sieves. We uh, need a pretty big sample, about a half a kilogram. We put them in order from biggest to smallest, we shake them and we figure out how much settles on each and that produces uh, uh, data in bins. This is only useful for sands and gravels. Laser diffraction, oh my goodness, this is the future. So this uses a series of lasers and uh, this quantifies the grain size distribution based on the angle of diffraction of the particles where uh, grain size increases, the angle of diffraction also increases. This is useful for clays, silts, and sands, but not gravels. The sample size for laser diffraction is 0.05 grams. Tiny, it's like a pinch of salt. So they have some advantages and some weaknesses, each of these. Sitting uses mass percent and laser diffraction uses volume percent for the calculations. Okay, so both of those generate data in bins. We then take that data and we plot it. Uh, on the left-hand side is an individual weight percent curve or a histogram, and that helps us quantify the modality of the samples. Then we calculate the cumulative percent over here. We plot that, and then we can calculate what are called grain size percentile values, the D50, which is the average, uh, 16, 5, 84, and 95. These represent different parts of the one standard deviation and two sigma range uh, of variance about the mean. So we take those and we can then calculate the graphic mean and the standard deviation or sorting of the samples, right? So this is a really nice quantitative way to analyze the grain size characteristics. Okay, so what we did is we got these new instruments. I got noticed December of 19, and then the world shut down before they showed up, and there was big delays. But anyway, eventually they showed up, and in the summer of 2021 then, we came here and we got samples from Presque Isle beaches and dunes, and also Erie Bluffs beaches. We measured grain size of uh, all of those samples, we generated then baseline data sets, and we then ran some tests to look at the reproducibility of the different methods. So we tried to run a couple tests to look at the performance of those methods. First off, we looked at the reproducibility of laser diffraction analysis. So keep in mind, really tiny samples. So for clays, only 50 milligrams. And so for sands, maybe up to 0.2 to 0.5 grams. It is hardly anything. And published data has shown some reproducibility concerns with that method. Second then, we wanted to compare laser diffraction versus sieving. So two different methods, one uses mass percent, the other volume percent, different size uh, materials needed for the analysis. And so studies have shown that laser diffraction can overestimate the coarse grains, but also underestimate the fine grains. And so uh, the Lake Erie samples are really our test to look at um, these questions. Okay, so the field work, which was the best part. We came here and we went to Presque Isle and we collected 20 paired beach and dune sediment samples in July, 2021. 
The map shows all the locations. Uh, so really nice day besides a really nasty thunderstorm at the beginning. Things got better over time. Really easy field work. And so most of my field work is super complicated, collecting heavy rocks. This was just putting sand in Ziploc bags. And so I, we had a, a really good time. Um, so I was on the beach with my daughters and the students over here on the left are just putting sand in Ziploc bags. All right, then we went to Erie Bluffs and um, it's you know, more sort of smaller pocket beaches there. So here we only got four beach samples and then two glacial till and two glacial lake samples along the bluff. The focus uh, in this talk again is on those beach samples. So here we are on the bluff. Uh, this was at the uh, uh, field conference of PA geology trip last year, which went to Erie Bluffs. We looked at the glacial stratigraphy. Um, they were very happy. I think this was their, their favorite site along the Lake Erie shoreline. Um, we also got some fluvial samples from Walnut Creek and Elk Creek. Um, on the ride home, Jess called me. Um, she touched her ankle. There was blood. She had a leech on her ankle. They were freaking out. I talked them down. They have now found this to be funny. Anyway, moving on. So results, right? So the focus here is on Presque Isle beaches, dunes, and Erie Bluffs beaches. So first we took images with the microscope. We did visual inspection. That is a representative Presque Isle beach. So quartz, rock fragments, and bivalve seashells. Uh, then we have the uh, curves at top right showing individual and uh, cumulative percent. Here are the summary stats for the mean and the sorting. Um, I'll just kind of blast through this. We'll look at the differences later, but the average here is 510 microns, and this was moderately well sorted. Presque Isle dunes, very similar, but more quartz, finer grained with minor rock fragments and bivalve seashells. The mean here was 480 microns. This was also moderately well sorted. Erie Bluffs beaches. These are similar to Presque Isle beaches, so mostly quartz, rock fragments, and uh, shell fragments. Only four samples, and those were um, a bit finer yet at 399 microns and also moderately well sorted. Okay, so we wanted to see if we could distinguish beaches in dunes, and global data shows us that dune sands are finer grained and they're much better sorted compared to beach sands. Here is the Presque Isle data. So the biplot shows mean grain size in the X and sorting in the Y. And dang it, they appear to be quite indistinguishable. So they should plot in unique space, but they don't. Um, we don't know why. So still trying to figure that out. Here's the overlay of the global average data for dunes, beaches, and fluvial point bar deposits. And you'll note here that Presque Isle samples, both of these plot along with fluvial or point bar samples, nowhere really close to dune samples, kind of close to beach sand samples. Okay, so research has surprising results. Laser diffraction reproducibility. We picked three samples. We measured each 10 times. And these are just box and whisker plots that show that this is highly reproducible, right? So averages, and the calculated standard deviations are extremely low in fee units. And so this certainly supports the notion that these are quite consistent and reproducible as it means to look at this data. OK, so the last thing that we did was then compare laser diffraction analysis for a suite of 39 beach and dune samples with the corresponding sieve analysis. So we did both on the samples. And then we calculated the overall mean and the standard deviation of those. I should finally use this so I can help you. Is the middle one the pointer? Yeah. OK. So here we have the uh, grain size laser diffraction. That's the calculated mean, 1.137 fee, and sieve, 1.394. Those are quite different. The standard deviation of them is quite similar. The sorting then, which is mathematically the standard deviation, this gets kind of confusing. So the mean of that for laser diffraction was 0.347, and for the sieve was 0.352. So those are a bit more similar. OK. So then we ran simple linear regression to quantify the correlations. So two plots here. Top uh, left here, we have uh, t-tests to compare the overall means and variance about the mean for those two samples. This is where it gets even more confusing, at least to me. 
So the t-test uh, stat here for grain size was 0 0.00, and at an alpha of 0.05, this is not the same. This is statistically different. You can actually see that if you look at that best fit line, come up at one phi and go across over here. So that is not a one-to-one -one relationship for grain size. Same thing for standard deviation, which is sorting over here. R squared now was 0.43. So that appears to be a lot more messy. The uh, t-test, though, the value here was 0.4, which is much greater than 0.05. And so this is similar statistically. What? I don't know. OK. So my conclusions. So first off, the mean grain size of samples was reproducible, I think, for both, method, both methods. But there certainly are some bias. So for laser diffraction, we only analyze very well-sorted samples. We didn't analyze poorly sorted samples. And so I'm not sure if this would be as consistent. Number two, then, for beach and dune samples, they are not readily distinguishable based on their mean to sorting cross plots. So they should plot, I think, in distinct space. They do not. I don't know why. Um, could it be some bias in sample collection? Was there beach nourishment that day, the day before? I don't think so. Uh, but perhaps there was some sort of anthropogenic modification that we didn't know of. Um, that was and still is quite surprising to me. And then our laser diffraction versus sieve comparison, right? So this is uh, what we saw here is that mean grain size was different, but it had a high R squared value. Standard deviation or sorting, right? This was similar, but it had a low R squared value. So um, differences explaining why uh, we got these results. I'm not really sure. Uh, but one thing I think is that there are different sizes needed for analysis. So laser diffraction, really tiny, sieving, a lot of material. We could have subsampling bias. I'll leave it at that. I see the, the sign that's saying wrap it up. OK. OK. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeanette. Yeah. So happy to take any questions about this. Um, the pictures was the, the sediment is so beautiful. My goodness, people. So sand under a microscope. I have bias, but I mean, look at these quartz grains. There's uh, regular quartz, rose quartz, citrine, rock fragments. It's pretty good. Yeah. Where on the beach did you take your beach sample? Good question. So in the intertidal zone. Okay. So in the... Um, I was wondering if that is influenced. Yeah. Not. I I, so right below the, the high water line, yeah. which is in the uh, shore face, so in the shore face environment. So I wonder if the global data sets, they uh, end up sampling the uh, back beach, yeah. where you have the coarse grain lag of materials. Um, I think that's got to be part of it. Yeah, I think it's got to be somewhere on the beach. And then I think also in that global database, um, what are the actual beach environments there? They were actually They're, sampling, meaning, um, I mean, obviously this lake is quite large and we do get large waves and stuff here, but not, not nearly the same as what happens. Marine in versus marine uh, Great Lake. Yeah. yeah, so that's one thing that we thought. Um, but wave action is, is happening in both, but perhaps the magnitude of it is different in the uh, coastal ocean zone yeah, versus. Tide, so that might also, I don't know, right. I don't know, I have to. Think about it. I'm biased though too, but to sand, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's my jam too. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. I have maybe a question, but more thinking out loud. Yeah. Um, so when we have sand nourishment that's done here, that sand is vacuumed from the middle of the lake. Yeah. So are we by, like are we selecting those sand grain sizes to put on the beach? And then they move around, like, is, it, is that why it's not pretty? I don't know. Yeah. Like I said, I'm kind of thinking out loud about it. So this. we asked for, um, I forget the contact at the state park, but they let us know when they were doing beach nourishment after the fact. And I, I think it was, like, around when we sampled. So I wonder if we sampled on a day that was so soon after that wave action hadn't had a chance to properly sort and redistribute the sediments. Uh, but you're right, they just go offshore, I think. Uh, they don't do much. I should probably not say this. My understanding is I don't think there's a lot of let's match the grain size as they like suck it up from the, the lake and they blast it out in those cannons. But I don't know. But um, 
They're just the survey before to make sure that they're sampling, they're, they're sampling, at least in marine environments. I don't know exactly here in Pascal, but if you're putting sand on a beach in, a, in the U.S. on a coast, like marine coast, you have to do grain size analysis of where you're going to be taking your sample, oh. and it has to match. Right. It has to be clean, and it has to match. Right. They don't want mud. So, sure. Okay. Yeah, that would be kind of nasty. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I guess if I could do it again, I would um, maybe think more about our sampling regimen and, and kind of some of those issues. Um, but we, we only found out after the data showed up. It's hard to find a pristine beach that doesn't have beach nourishment, though, in the world. So that's true. That would be hard to do anywhere. That's true. Thank you very Thanks. much. Yeah. It's not showing on here, so I can't figure it out. Onto this one, so there you go. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Greg Andreso from Gannon University. Thanks, Jeanette, and thank you all for showing up on a, on a nice uh, November afternoon here in Erie. Uh, so a little bit of background, what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, was actually work done by two of my undergraduate students uh, along with me, uh, Alex and Maggie. Uh, they were doing this work about this time last year. It was a work in progress and then they graduated in May, so they've moved on to bigger and better things. So uh, I thought I'd share with you their work. So I'm going to talk to you today about heavy metals and gobies. I've been working with gobies since about 2002. Uh, about 2019, just talking to a couple students, uh, kicked around ideas of quantifying heavy metals in this fish, which took us into the world of ICP, MS, and all kind of things that aren't really my background. I'm a behavioral ecologist, evolutionary biologist uh, by training, but uh, I think it's always good to diversify, learn some new things. So we were interested in, uh, cons uh, in uh, quantifying heavy metals in tissues of round gobies, uh, in sediment, and water from uh, five sites here in, uh, in Erie County. So uh, most of you probably know the round goby is a non-native fish to the Great Lakes. It came from the Caspian Sea, Black Sea reg uh, region of Eurasia, uh, first detected in the Great Lakes about 1990. Here's a map that was uh, produced by the Great Lakes Environmental Assessment and Mapping Project, or GLEAM, several years ago, identifying the round goby as a stressor in the Great Lakes, uh, and really uh, uh, specifically in the shallow waters of Lake Erie. And that stressor is really kind of threefold, a uh, threat to biodiversity, economic costs, and then really what I'm talking about here uh, in growth. So, we could talk about that a little bit. Um, that round goby seems to play a role in the transfer of contaminants, especially fat-soluble things, uh, from sediments to higher trophic levels. Uh, uh, one of the things I've worked on over the years is consumption by round gobies of dracaenid mussels, uh, zebra mussels, and quagga mussels. Uh, those muscles are located on the bottom. They're benthic. The round goby is stuck on the bottom. It's a benthic species. It lacks a swim bladder, so it cannot move up in the water column for any length of time. So the idea is round gobies picking up uh, toxins associated with the sediments through consumption of food specifically mussels and other benthic organisms, also perhaps through the absorption of toxins in the sediment, uh, either through the gills or through the skin. And then those gobies 
uh, eaten by uh, uh, organisms higher in the food web, things like smallmouth bass and walleyes and lake trout and yellow perch, and ultimately uh, to humans through consumption of those fish. Uh, that's my son actually quite a few years ago. Right now he's six foot five with a beard and he's a, he's a sophomore at Yen. And, uh, I like that picture that was taken right across from the, uh, uh, from the Coast Guard station. So that idea of bioamplification of contaminants ultimately uh, to humans. So last year, uh, my student Alex, who's a co-author on this, he presented a little bit of pilot data looking at heavy metals uh, in gobies, liver tissue, muscle tissue, otoliths, and then also in the sediments. And this work was confined to the South Pier, uh, which uh, is part of the shipping channel that connects uh, Presque Isle Bay to the main part of Lake Erie. Found some interesting things. Uh, arsenic concentrations in the liver of round gobies, uh, about four parts per million. Uh, some uh, hi, uh, relatively high barium in, the, in their muscle tissue and in their otoliths, and then sediment uh, concentration as well, uh, some barium there. So what we wanted to do is expand this work into multiple sites uh, in Erie County and, and look at sediments, round gobies, and water. So the objective, the overall objective of the work was to use ICPMS. It's a highly sensitive uh, uh, way of quantifying uh, metals, uh, looking at nickel, arsenic, cadmium, and barium, and lead in gobies, three tissues, liver, muscle, and otoliths, and then look at the sediments where we collect the fish as well as water where we collect the fish uh, we chose those, uh, all are toxic, none should be uh, in the gobies. Uh, they, they don't have any sort of physiological role. And four of those five are RECRA-8 metals that uh, we've given uh, specific uh, attention to. So really five questions we were interested in. Uh, how do sediments compare among the sites in metal concentration? How does the water compare among sites? Uh, what's the relationship of these metals and the sediments and the water? Uh, are they predictive of one another? Do they correlate? How do round goby tissues compare among sites? And then do differences in sediment and or water uh, predict what's going on in the goby? Those are the questions we were interested in. So our sites, there's actually three from the bay. Uh, one of them, MM, that's our mid-monthly sampling site, some work we've been doing for the last seven or eight years out in the bay. We collect these fish by trawling. Another site, for lack of a better term, we just call the PIB, so that's a, another Presque Isle Bay site. And then the South Pier, that's the shipping channel. And then a site out in the western part of the county, that, uh, the gravel pit located in Fairview. And then also Lake LaBeouf down in Waterford uh, was uh, the fifth uh, site of our gobies. Uh, uh, interestingly, gobies were introduced there, made their way into LaBeouf Creek, and then from there made their way into French Creek. And there's some people associated with the RSC. I know Casey Bradshaw has been working with them uh, for a number of years. So those are our sites, a little bit on our design here. So from each site, we took 12 uh, gobies. We size matched them, which should be roughly age matched. Uh, we took the sagittal otoliths, uh, liver, and muscle. Uh, and then we had five samples per site. Uh, we collected either with an Ekman dredge or a petite ponar. Uh, interestingly, the sediments really vary physically, uh, really silty clay stuff out in that mid-monthly site, Presque Isle Bay, South Pier loaded with like Dreisenid shells, Lake La Buffalo, more mix of sand and gravel, and Fairview gravel pit, some sand and gravels as well. Uh, and then water samples, we collected half a meter off the bottom, uh, filtered them, and processed them from there. Just generally some ICPMS methodology, uh, involves uh, digestion with uh, concentrated nitric acid, usually with heat, uh, break down organic compounds with hydrogen peroxide, uh, sediment and water samples get filtered after that, dilution methods 
the ICPMS methodology is highly, highly sensitive. You would think you'd want concentrated samples, but you want just the opposite. The methodology can detect concentrations to a, a one part per trillion, so it's not a matter of the machine's detection ability. You could actually kind of clog up the works of the ICPMS uh, with too many uh, 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 dissolved solids. Uh, you use all plastic, no glass, you don't want metals leaching in from glassware and things like that. And then we acid wash everything super careful with our techniques so we're not introducing these metals uh, in our methodology. So I'm going to show you a number of figures that look like this. Uh, these are the results of multivariate analyses. Here we're looking at the sediments. So we're simultaneously looking at nickel and lead and arsenic, barium and cadmium uh, in the sediments, uh, principal components, if you're familiar with that. Here's PC1. Basically, we're asking uh, what percentage of the variance in sediments are explained. Here, our principal component one explains 86% of the variance. And then we could talk about our loadings. That is explained on this end of the axis by high concentrations of all five of those metals, and at this end of the axis, low concentration of all those. So what we find here, this is really the take home message, the sediments vary uh, in terms of heavy metal composition, and interestingly, our mid-monthly site, Presque Isle Bay and South Pier are all different from one another in the overall composition of those sediments. They're all bay, uh, they're all relatively close to one another, but they're statistically different from one another. We could look at each one of those metals, uh, look at means and standard deviations. Uh, we could look at those individually. I don't want to spend too much time there. Uh, we can look, for example, at each site and how it, maybe I lost bad, uh, compares to the others. For example, the mid-monthly site is different from the South Pier site statistically in terms of nickel and cadmium and lead, and all those comparisons are there if you want to look at any of them. PECs, for reference, are probable effect concentrations, so uh, no real concern about any of those. The HPT is the highly polluted threshold there for barium. You can see a couple of those sites exceed the HPT. So how about the water among sites? Uh, really, uh, we see some variation. Fairview gravel pit different from uh, uh, the mid-monthly and the Presque Isle Bay site, but we don't see any statistically significant difference in water composition among the three bay sites. And we see that really it's barium concentration that explains almost all uh, of the variation in water concentrations, okay? And there's a look at barium in, in water. Notice you're talking about, that'd be about 300 parts uh, per billion, right? I think I have my decimal places, uh, right? Or uh, pretty low concentrations in the water. So how about that relationship between water and sediment? Uh, what's going on in the sediments does not predict what's going on in the water. So it's not like I uh, picture sort of a T uh, between the sediment and then that stuff all kind of gets in the water and it sort of mirrors concentration in the sediments. That does not seem to be the case. So how about the gobies? How do the gobies compare in terms of those metals? All right, again, we see differences between sites specifically that's uh, it's laser. The South Pier site is different from the Presque Isle Bay site. Uh, the PIB site, you see Fairview Gravel Pit different from everyone else. Uh, Lake LaBeouf is different from everyone else. Uh, and that's explained on the uh, right hand side of this axis by high otolith barium, high muscle barium concentration, and then at the other end of that axis, high liver. Uh, arsenic concentration. Okay. When we look at those, arsenic in the liver really stands out of those fish from South Pier. Um, so what's up with arsenic in the liver of those fish? If you were to compare that to the pilot data I showed with you, very similar. So our results across the two studies uh, uh, agree 
uh, very nicely. We see some differences in barium otolith and barium muscle uh, as well. But those South Pier gobies, for some reason, seem to have high, relatively high concentrations of arsenic uh, in their livers. And then the last question, do differences in the sediments and or water uh, explain or predict concentrations in those gobies? And the bottom line is, for sediments, yes. That all organ composition, meaning let's take liver, muscle, otoliths, let's look at the concentrations of metals in all of those. Let's look at all of those metals in the sediments, and we have predictive ability there. The all organ composition in the gobies is explained by or is predicted by what's going on in the sediments, but not the water. Okay, so to summarize all that, sediments varied across sites, right? Differences explained by all of those metals, lead, barium, nickel, arsenic, and cadmium. Interestingly, those three sites in the bay, two in the main bay and then the south pier, they differ from one another, all of them. Water varied uh, across sites, explained mostly by barium concentrations, no differences in the water in the three bay sites. Sediments did not, cor uh, sediment composition didn't predict water composition. They did not correlate at a statistically significant level. And also the round goby tissues varied across sites. Differences explained by barium in the otoliths, barium in the muscle, and then liver uh, or arsenic uh, in the liver. And then the Presque Isle Bay and South Pier sites were different. And that's really interesting to us. You know, those are close to one another, I'd say within a half a mile of one another. Uh, and you have differences in these goby concentrations. So that's interesting. I think that kind of reinforces the idea of, a, of small home ranges of these fish, right? If these fish sort of moved around the bay randomly, constantly, experiencing those different sediments, I would expect their organ concentrations to be quite similar, but, but they're not. I think they're, you know, they're picking up stuff from those sediments, uh, you know, where they're living and they're, they're, they're kind of home bodies, which has been uh, described in the, in the literature, okay? So, uh, work for, uh, work for or not work, but money for this uh, project. Uh, I had a, a little faculty uh, research grant through Gannon, uh, good funding through our biology department and our college. Uh, we Dom Kim in our environmental science uh, and engineering program helped me out with digestion methods and those kind of things. Jerry McGraw at Barron, awesome guy. He's the, like, the, the, the analytical guru around here. We send him samples. He runs the analysis. He makes sure the IPCPMS is working the way it should. Uh, Sam Polson, our captain of our Environaut, uh, always does a great job, puts you where you need to be. And then uh, various collaborators within the biology department, a bunch of students from the freshwater marine biology and biology majors uh, at Gannon helped with collection of, of sediments uh, and water. So be happy to field any questions. There's kind of a lot there. I want to make sure I got through it. Uh, have a few minutes for questions. Uh, if you want to talk methods and things like that, I'm happy to do that. I didn't want to bore you with method detection limits and method blanks and QC and all that stuff. So your water samples are about half a meter above the bottom, is that what you said? Right. Do you think you would see a much stronger correlation between heavy metals in the water if you were right at that interface? Yeah, yeah. That, we wanted to get close, but not too close, right? Because you get down there and you bump your sampler against the bottom and you're kicking up sediments, right? Yeah, so. And, and I don't do that, but I mean, because that's where the gobies live, too. Is like right, that kind of boundary yeah. between the two, yeah. And I would expect the further away you get from that interface, the the less related the water and the, and the sediments are. I thought half a meter was pretty close, but yeah, you're right. The, 
maybe for a second or two, you know, goby kind of darts up off the bottom, grabs something to eat, and it's back down there. It's not living much of its life that far off the bottom. And we collected our water samples before the sediment samples to avoid kicking up the bottom and everything. Yeah. That'd be a good little study, yeah? Yeah, I'm happy to. Yeah. Oh, crap, I kicked up the, I kicked up the bottom, now I up the, yeah. I could imagine some sort of little sort of gauge or little landing yeah, structure. Yeah, I think you kind of like, like sit there for a minute to let the sediment Right, settle. yeah, put and your then, feet on our and sample the water bottles, or yeah, something like that. Yeah, mm -hmm. and look at that, see if there's a correlation, yeah. Yeah, not with my ears. I, I was trained to scuba dive. If I, if I snorkel and go three feet underwater, it feels like my, my, yeah. like my eardrums are going to burst now. Yeah. Yeah. So the, 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 to go on this uh, tilt, but the grain size variations, right? So the fine grain samples should have higher cation kind of exchange capacity. They should absorb more metals. I wonder if any... Yeah, right, so what we do to try to control for that, we sieve them, we samples less than one millimeter. Yeah. So we've actually looked at, you, I like your pictures of your sediments, we've actually looked at goby guts and they will ingest sediments as they're feeding on benthic stuff and we've quantified grain size. So the grain size we use for our ICPMS is similar to you know what we find these fish actually ingesting. So. Yeah, and I don't know, is, is, that a, is that a decent way to do it? You know, control for your grain size, even though in, a, in like the Fairview gravel pit, you have gravels and sands and... Yeah, because the clays and silts are gonna absorb a lot more metals. And I've done work in clay and silt lake sediment borders where we see big differences um, in the size fractions. So, um, and they're, they're very weakly absorbed, like arsenic, lead, et cetera. These are methods things again, but uh, we use 2% nitric for our, our studies in any of these, and uh, that was, what was the percent? It was higher, and also you're using hot acid. So yeah, you know, hot acid, so that initial digestion, because like, it, it's a one-to-one, -one, basically 50% nitric at 100 C for, what I think, the, the three hours, I think, is the first, and then you run through like three rounds of that. I don't know how we're doing. You got 15 seconds. 15 seconds. <laughs> I was wondering um, why arsenic is have a higher concentration in the liver specifically, rather than like there's also a lot of barium or a lot of lead in there. Right. Like, and why it's, arsenic in the liver? Why arsenic in the liver, especially if we were to study right, those Garrett, pictures? Right. Good, the right. arsenic in the sediments at the south here or else that we go. So in the sediments, the go, that we go, but in the livers, it's high. I think it's a diet thing. I think it's a, a zebra mussel playing the middleman somehow. I'd like to look at arsenic in those zebra mussels, see if they're getting it from that. Because just the sediment alone doesn't predict that. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so our next speaker is Garrett McClelland from uh, Gannon, Gannon University. Sorry about that. You're good. Thank you. I just say, hi, thank you for coming out today. Um, my name is Garrett McClelland. I'm a senior math major at uh, Gannon University. I'm here because I've got a biology minor and I'm doing my research on the sunfish in the bay. And then I was also looking at water quality. So, you know, I just say, you might want to know how we collected this data. We collected this data uh, using many different devices and methods. Uh, for my water quality, we uh, use the YSI, uh, which collects our, our temperature, uh, dissolved O2, and pH is what I looked at. And we looked at that from the top of the water column down to five meters in the bay. Uh, and then for collecting fish, we did a bottom fish trawl. And we started at that little uh, yellow dot there, which is where we also collected the data. Troll for 10 minutes in the direction of the arrow with on the bottom of uh, the bay. And during that, we collected a lot of different species, all the way from uh, yellow perch to big carp to the sunfish that I looked at. Uh, the common sunfish is what I looked at, which is Lepomus. Uh, 
which is pumpkin seed and bluegill. The amount of sunfish in the bay, uh, they main mainly come in in late spring and uh, middle of summer. Uh, and then you can see on the chart here, uh, once it hits September, the two green lines, they can, uh, kind of level out and leave, which means they don't show up in September through November. Uh, the yellow uh, line, you may be wondering on that chart, is uh, shiners, and I decided to add shiners in there to see if they're sticking around for a food source or if that was also a reason that they would like to be there, but it seems to not affect them leaving in the fall. Uh, these are warm water fish, like I said, so they come in uh, late spring and uh, mid-August. So, and then to start, I, uh, I was looking at bluegill, and we got multiple charts here, some through the years and some over months. So you can see our largest catch was in August of 2019, uh, and then our uh, catch data has uh, continue to grow. Uh, 2019 through 2022 were our largest catches. Uh, and then looking at the population of bluegill and when they show up and that kind of stuff, the, you can see they're here in August. And then from 2019 and 2020, they started to come in earlier and earlier. So August, and then the dark green line, you have July, and then in June, right at the end of 2022 and the bigger bluegill as well. So I looked at the bluegill over 125 millimeters uh, and they are following the same trend as the population together. So these uh, bluegill are starting to come in earlier and earlier each year in the summer. Uh, reasons for that can vary from water temperature to many different environmental factors. So I decided to look at the pumpkin seed uh, next for uh, the common sunfish. And again, August uh, was our large catch rate, or our largest um, catch, and that was in 2022 though, which was more recently. Uh, again though, 2020 through 2022, largest catch data. So our catch data is getting better, the population's growing of these common sunfish. Uh, but the pumpkin seed, when they're starting to show up, is changing. The, in July, they're starting to show up uh, September, October, or, uh, 2017, 2018, in July, they were here. And then August was when they showed up in 2019. And then again, oops, sorry. Uh, and then July, uh, again in 2020, 2021, and then back to August. I'd say it'd be very interesting to see what the cycle is or if there's a cycle continuing for these uh, data, whether next year they'll come back in July or if they'll transfer to August again. Uh, just like the bluegill, the pumpkin seed, ooh, sorry, the uh, pumpkin seed, the larger ones are following similar trends as the total population. Uh, sorry, June, July, and then August, July, July, and August again. So the big pumpkin seed are following the smaller pumpkin seed or the general population. And then uh, lastly, I wanted to see how that compared to many different uh, qual uh, factors, but specifically water, because that's what the fish live in. So I looked at temperature, dissolved oxygen, and pH. Uh, the temperature, the uh, temperature you can see from 2017 to uh, 2022. I'd say it started high and then dropped specifically in the fall. And you can see October and November, the months on the ends of summer, are uh, trending to get warmer. So from 2018 to 2022. The, you can see the chart over the years have gotten significantly warmer. Uh, the dissolved oxygen as well, it has increased. You can tell when uh, this could be because of the temperature in the water as well. They could affect each other along with when the fish are coming in. They could be doing this because of significant uh, changes in dissolved oxygen temperature. Uh, I found it interesting to look at pH but the bay is real well mixed. So the pH in the bay, you can see it changes along with temperature, but it stays relatively consistent on a basic or on a neutral level. Uh, so there's a lot of different, I just wanna say that there's a lot of different factors that are causing these bluegill and sunfish to come in at different times. The, like I said, the bluegill, they're starting to come in earlier and earlier, and the pumpkin seed are coming in later. 
they could be affecting each other or it could be uh, a number of different factors in the water quality or the environment that they're living in. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, all my professors of the biology department at Gannon and my math research advisor at, the, at Gannon, as well as the captain of the boat. Uh, any questions? I was just curious, was your data collection able to be consistent during like COVID months? Uh, How did that work? There was two months we were unable to go collect fish. I say uh, I wasn't in college for those two months, but uh, those two months were not collected, but we did still take water samples. So, so yeah, in 2020, we were able to get out in July. In July, and then through the rest of our season, yes, yeah, so we could get out to May or June. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Long after. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? I have a quick question. Yeah. Do um, the bluegill and pumpkin seed, do they have the same diet? I was just wondering uh, like, if they're moving in different areas. They do have different diets. That is a, I believe it's the sunfish or the bluegill. They will eat mainly zooplankton and other plankton in the water and sunfish will eat uh, many different things from mollusks to crayfish to uh, shiners. So, yep. Yeah, diet could definitely be another factor. So, thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, our next speaker is Antian Pinar from Grove City College. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Today I'll be speaking to you on the, uh, the preliminary results of a project I'm working on with a professor at Grove City for the spatial distribution of eastern sand darters in western Pennsylvania. The eastern sand darter is a state-listed endangered species. It is a benthivoric sand specialist. It tends to have a translucent appearance. It is in the family Persidae, and it has very unique behavior of burying itself almost completely in sand, usually with only the eyes and the rostrum sticking out. Um, they have unique habitat requirements of water temperatures less than 33 degrees Celsius, a velocity of less than 20 centimeters per second in the stream or lake where they are, minimal turbidity because they are a site predator on macroinvertebrates and greater than 90 percent sandy substrate and that sandy substrate needs to be within a very particular range of between 0.24 and 0.54 millimeters that range is important because as they're buried in the sand they need water to be able to flow through the interstitial spaces so that they can still breathe while buried in the sand. That's another reason why they need that lower velocity, less than 20 centimeters a second, so that you can have sand deposition for their habitat. They use burying in sand for velocity respite, for ambushing macroinvertebrates, and for avoiding predators. Historically, the eastern sand darter was present in Lake Erie in the French Creek watershed, which you can see here, and the upper Monongahela watershed here but currently they're limited only to Lake Erie and the French Creek watershed due to um, three general human caused disturbances. The first being siltation from loss of riparian barriers. If you have siltation, the silt fills in the interstitial spaces between sand grains or completely covers them up so that they lose their habitat. The second is rising water temperatures. The third is water pollution. And another more recent one, unfortunately, is invasive species such as the round goby, which are present in French Creek and which occupy the same kind of ecological niche. These issues led us to the following two objectives. The first was to predict the potential range of the eastern sand darter in the French Creek watershed 
using a statistical algorithm called Maxent. And the second was to test the fitness of that Maxent model um, with eDNA to see how uh, useful it was for predicting the presence of eastern sand darter. The French Creek watershed covers over 3,000 square kilometers. It is known for having fairly good riparian barriers and for having a higher than average uh, emergent herbaceous wetland and woody wetland than other uh, watersheds in western Pennsylvania, although it does have a significant area of uh, cultivated crops and agricultural land as well. It flows from southwest New York here down through western Pennsylvania, where it ends at the confluence with the Allegheny River at Franklin, Pennsylvania. Objective one was to predict the potential range of the eastern sand darter in the French Creek watershed using Maxent modeling. Maxent is a statistical algorithm that layers uh, GIS habitat layers on top of each other and then takes a presence-only vector data set and layers it over those layers. The idea being to calculate um, a probability between zero and one of your particular species being present in a cell based on that cell similarity to cells with known physical detections. We were given a uh, data set on known physical detections of eastern sand darter by the Pennsylvania Heritage Diversity Group. The samplers for that were the Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission between 1985 and 2022. The exact locations are not shown here due to the sensitivity of the data, but these four watersheds here outlined in orange are the ones where the Fish and Boat Commission found physical detections of the eastern sand darter. We then uploaded our GIS layers in 30 meter rasters to the Maxent algorithm. We used slope and few accum flow accu accumulation as proxies for velocity. You need the slow velocity for sand deposition. And so we calculated the slope and flow accumulation on the watershed scale, which was a Huck 8. Um, we use surficial geology as a layer as well because you need sandstone to provide sand presence. And finally, we used reclassified layers of a national land cover database from 2019. First, your upland land cover, terrestrial plants that can help control erosion and sedimentation. Your wetland land cover, which can help filter that sedimentation and increase water quality. And your agricultural land cover, which generally speaking increases sedimentation. The model was run for 20 iterations and 25% of the data was withheld to test the model accuracy of the cells that Maxent is predicting versus the cells where we know there are known physical detections. That data yielded an accuracy of 0.996, which is very high. And surficial geology and wetland land cover ranked highest as far as the model contribution to its own predictions. We then uh, restrict restricted it to areas of flow, the streams, although it was calculated on the scale of the entire watershed because it doesn't just, just matter where the water is flowing, it also matters where that water came, th came from and all the land cover classes that it went through to get to the point where it was. Therefore, because we're using eDNA sampling of DNA that is flowing through the stream, we then found the highest cell in each Huck 12 sub-watershed and used that as a measure of the maximum probability of detection in that sub-watershed. The results of the model. Maximum probability values in each Huck 12 sub-watershed, for example, this one here or this one here, ranged between 0 0.04 and 0 0.97. Nine of the sub-watersheds stood out as having maximum predictive values greater than 40% and five of those nine watersheds were outside of the current known range of the sand darter. So, as before, the orange ones are the ones where we know there are known physical detections, but these five also had very similar Maxent values, but were outside of the known range of the eastern sand darter. This led us to objective two, to test the usefulness of the model, to see how useful it is for predicting um, positive detections with eDNA. We collected a one liter water sample from each of the Huck 12 sub-watersheds within the French Creek watershed. We also had bottled water at each site as a negative control and then filtered these samples and controls in the lab with 0.45 micrometer filters and stored them in ethanol, then extracted the DNA using the Kyogen DNAZ blood and tissue kit 
and then amplified them with a primer designed by Reed and Haxton 2020. That Reed and Haxton citation is important because they found in that paper that this primer that they designed only amplifies Eastern sand darter DNA. It does not amplify closely related species. Uh, using the apply, Applied Biosystem Step 1 Plus, and the initial tests that we have done so far are of those seven watersheds with max scent values greater than 0.4. Our results were interesting. So for these three watersheds here that were greater than 0.4 and we have known physical detections, all three of those tested positive. For those outside the known range with those higher max scent values, they all tested negative. And a very interesting thing here is if you look at the Watson run, uh, it has a max scent predicted value of 83%. It tested negative. Meanwhile, Wheeler Creek, which has a predicted value of only 41%, tested positive. So we have some work to do as to finding out why this model is, is not generally consistent with what with the positive detections that we're seeing. However, it is notable that the detections are consistent with what we know from uh, that presence data set, uh, data set that we have. Um, we only have one sample in each of the HUC-12s. It is possible that some of the DNA flowing through the stream was missed. Um, it is also possible that slope and flow accumulation, which we used as proxies for velocity, were not sufficient modelers of velocity. Unfortunately, we were not able to find a reliable velocity data set for the streams in French Creek. That would have been great. Um, and so we are going to have to find a, possibly a, a better way to model velocity in these streams. The eDNA results are consistent with what uh, the Fish and Boat Commission found, and 26 samples in the remainder of French Creek await PCR testing. I'd like to thank the following entities and individuals. Do we have any questions? most important thing, in, in my opinion, is conservation of riparian barriers, woody wetlands, and emergent herbaceous wetlands um, in order to stop the sedimentation that covers up their sandy habitat. French Creek has a lot of underlying sandstone geology, so the capacity for the sand being there is there. We just need to stop it from being covered up in sediment. PCR seems to be one of those kind of magical things where you have to wear the right hat on the right day and do, to, to uh, you know, de detect or fail to detect that, you know, the idea of running negative controls or ha having DNA from other maybe closely related darters and make sure those don't amplify, I think is important. I mean, it, people publish the results Primers are part of it, but annealing temperatures and times and everything are also important in that process, as well as you know all the other ingredients that go in there. So I guess I'd recommend that you do uh, run positive controls if you, have, if you have any sand dart or DNA from anywhere, as well as negative controls from the other closely related. Yeah, thank you. We did run uh, positive controls of Eastern sand darter, and we also did run a serial dilution of the known positive control to help us um, gain, gain confidence in the results that we were seeing. But absolutely, a adding closely related species would be a very good control as well. Neat stuff. Thank you. Next presentation is Eli Ripka from Allegheny's Watershed Conservation Research Center. Make sure I know how this thing works. Okay, hi. So the side is forward, backwards, and pointer. Sorry about that. All right. 
So I'm a student at Allegheny College. I'm an environmental science major, and I'm doing an independent study, jumping on research on brook trout population connectivity based on data collected in tributaries stemming from Oil Creek in Crawford County. So brook trout are, have a native range spanning much of the eastern United States. They are the only trout species native to this region. As well as being an important game species, they are regarded as indicators of healthy stream environments as they require clean cold waters to survive. Over the last 200 years, the region has undergone dramatic changes due to human activities such as agriculture, urban development, and climate change. As you can see here, we are in the westernmost part of their region. So brook trout have been extirpated from about 21% of subwatersheds in their historic range. Decline in extirpation have been um, reported in brook trout populations across the region. Larger river systems that once contained brook trout no longer support self-staining populations as they are now isolated in small headwater habitats. This can lead to loss of connectivity in completely isolated populations. So this map here shows in black all of the areas that the brook trout have been extirpated from and that includes right around where we are. So one major threat to brook trout is the invasion of brown trout. Brown trout are a non-native species that are known to outcompete brook trout in larger river systems and have pushed brook trout into their higher elevation headwater tributary habitats. So what can be done to mitigate the threat from brown trout? It has been found that barriers downstream of headwater tributaries can prevent brown trout invasion. However, there are concerns about connectivity loss due to barriers impeding brook trout movement. Isolated populations can also be more at risk to environmental disturbances if they cannot migrate and they might lose access to seasonal resources. Um, oops. So there's a couple different type categories of barriers we looked at. So there's natural barriers, which includes beaver impoundments and resulting wetlands. And these can actually be really beneficial because it's been found that brook trout are able to navigate through these barriers, whereas brown trout cannot. And there's some examples of your natural barriers. Of greater concern are man-made barriers, such as culverts and bridges. Poorly constructed culverts can impede movement of fish, which can also lead to population isolation. Previous studies have found evidence of, of loss of population connectivity at sites with culverts as compared to those without. And here are some examples of what you might see of stream crossing structures. This is something that we like to see that's probably not going to impede fish movement. The stream is allowed to flow through pretty naturally. There's no uh, drop off or constriction and there's, the sediment is all the same all the way through. And that this is an example of what we don't like to see, a very poorly constructed culvert that did not have fish passage in mind. There's this big drop off, there's no sediment in there, it's very channelized with high velocity. So for the study we had two hypotheses. Number one, that um, culvert barriers will impact brook trout con connectivity and that natural barriers will not impact brook trout connectivity. So what we did was we used electrofishing to survey brook trout populations upstream of barriers between tributaries in the main stem of Oil Creek. So we had one person use a pulsed DC backpack electrofisher to shock the water about every one meter along 100 meter tract. And the pulse just temporarily stuns the fish. They float up and they're very easy to see, very easy to scoop up with nets. And so we had like two people scooping with nets. And it also guarantees that you get like all of the fish in your given area. So we just put them in a bucket with an aerator so they could recover. And when we got to the end of the tract, we measured them all in millimeters and released them. And our objective here is to record population densities and diversity of age classes in brook trout based on their age, or based on their size. So we also conducted NAC surveys. Um, we surveyed the aquatic organism passability, or AOP, of culverts in multiple tributaries using NAC protocols, NAC being the North Atlantic Aquatic Connectivity Collaborative. To determine passability scores, we looked at the different types of structures. So is it a bridge? Is it a culvert? You can see there's lots of different kinds of culverts. We look at the structure's dimensions using a meter stick and a tape measure. We look at the height, width, and length. We looked at the width and depth of water as compared to the rest of the stream. We look for the outlet drop-off height, which you saw in the early example, but none of these have it. Um, we look for constriction in flow velocity, so is the water being forced through a much more narrow area at a higher velocity. We're looking at sediment within the structure, if it matches the outside of the structure. 
We're looking for if debris is blocking passage, and we're also looking for dry passage, which in this upper example, you can see there's a lot of dry passage, and there's still a lot of water flowing through there, but sometimes there is not a lot of water flowing through there, and that can impede passage. Basically, what we want to see is that the um, conditions inside the structure match the conditions outside, outside the structure. So results. Um, so here we have Brook Trout age classes as a function against the NAC AOP score. And here we have Brook Trout density as a function against the NAC AOP score. And what we expected was that the higher the NAC score, the um, would correlate higher with higher densities and diversities. But what we found is that there's pretty much no correlation at all. And as you can see here, both the p-values are well above 0 0.05. There's like no significance at all. So hypothesis one, not supported. Um, so hypothesis two, we compared brook trout density and age classes in areas with natural barriers such as beaver dams versus areas without. And we found the same thing, that um, brook trout demographics were unaffected. So here we have densities and here we have age classes. Once again, p-values are well and above. Um, 0 0.05, so this does support our second hypothesis. So we observed no effect of barriers on brook trout connectivity in Oil Creek tributaries, and they do not appear to be affected by man-made or natural barriers. It should be noted, though, that brown trout were only found in two streams that did not have barriers, which is further evidence to suggest that barriers are preventing their invasion. So why didn't we see a relationship between um, the NAC scores and the brook trout? Well, it's probably because brook trout are among the strongest swimmers in the region, and they have been found to be able to navigate more difficult crossings. Previous studies have found limits to what they can navigate, but despite those challenges, the barriers seem to only partially impede their movement. Um, the greatest effect seen from culverts are basically the openness ratio, and that's the, um, the width versus length of a culvert, the longer and narrower it is narrower it is, the higher velocity of the water and the smaller the opening, and pair that with a really high drop off. Even if the brook trout can get through there, a lot of them won't. It's just a very difficult barrier to get past, so only a few of the strongest and most determined individuals are going to make it through. So while we didn't find any evidence of impact based on demographics, previous studies have found evidence when looking at brook trout genetics, so that suggests that culverts can still limit their connectivity. And at the end of the day, um, it can be surmised that improving stream crossing structures would maximize connectivity in their headwater tributary habitats. So this project was motivated in part by upcoming culvert replacements in two of the streams that we surveyed, um, DeWolf Run and Riceville Run. And this is what the DeWolf Run culvert currently looks like. As you can see, it's, it's like a terrible obstacle for fish. There is almost no water coming through. It's a trickle. It's got this huge drop off. There's no sediment in there. You got this massive scour pole. It's, um, and it's like at least a foot um, above the rest of the water. So we're looking forward to seeing that replaced. And basically, what it prevents a big opportunity, though, to compare brook trout demographics um, now with future data after the replacement of the culverts, which would allow us to evaluate if better constructed culverts will improve brook trout conductivity in the future. And I would like to thank um, Mark Kirk and Meredith Barney in the back at the um, WCRC at Allegheny College. They helped me with my sampling and instructed my independent study and all that. Okay, great. Thank you. Recent questions. Do we have time for questions? Yeah. Um, I just had a question. So you're saying the uh, brown trout are taking over the brook trout's uh, area, correct? Yeah. Is there a reason for that? Are the brown trout just more aggressive, or are the brook trout just kind of, you know what I'm saying? What's yeah. the reason the brown trout are taking over? So basically, the brown trout are more, are a bit more aggressive and voracious. They have been known to like, they eat more food. They stress the brown trout out when they're living, the brook trout out when they're living in the same environment. And they're also more tolerant of warmer waters. So the brook trout are kind of moving up into higher elevations anyway. And I think that combined with the stress of another more aggressive species in the area has caused them to just completely abandon their um, larger river habitats. Yep. Sorry if I missed this, but as the Fish and Boat Commission, have they um, 
classify these streams, like class A, natural trout, and then I'm curious, with your data, did, did you take that and classify it? So like, how productive are these wild brook trout tributaries? Um, so I'm not really sure about that. I know that a lot that the tributaries are classified as brook trout habitat, like they've been recorded recorded there before and also the data set that I was working with actually incorporated a lot of data from several years before I jumped on the project. So like we definitely know where they are or where they haven't been, but I don't really know what the fish and the boat commission had to say about it. Yeah, I should. I have I have a report to write on this, so that might be useful. So thank you. Really well done. Uh, I could have a follow up to that. Say, yeah. oh, several okay. of the streams are class Listed, which we have, we initially gave them ready for service in 2012 and 2016. You did have a copy of the list that they forgot to list it. Our next speaker is Hope Burbank from Indiana University of Pennsylvania. All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Hope Burbank, and I'm a third year geology student at the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm working with the Evergreen Conservancy and my professor, Dr. K Catherine Farnsworth, who's here today. Um, the Evergreen Conservancy is a nonprofit organization in Indiana County, um, and we are establishing a baseline of stream characteristics and working with our community. So as a little bit of background, as a lot of us probably know, if you're from Pennsylvania, um, a lot of the streams and rivers look somewhat like this um, because they're really impacted by um, human resource extraction, especially coal mining, and it leads to a lot of pollution. So that is one of the main goals of the Evergreen Conservancy is to restore these streams. So. This is one of the examples at the Tonoma Creek. Um, they use this for education and restoration. This is one of the ways you can restore a area affected by um, different pollutants. So this is a passive treatment um, site where they are slowly trying to get rid of those pollutants. So we are in Indiana County. The red shaded region is just for reference. And then there is a red point for reference where we are now. Um, so our stream monitoring locations are placed all throughout Indiana um, County and the stream data loggers that Evergreen Conservancy has put in the streams um, record temperature, water level, and conductivity that we later converted into TDS or total dissolved solids. So we are working with our community, um, obviously, and there's a lot of benefits to working with our community. Um, that's local experts and you have a lot of people that are really interested in what they're doing. Um, it's people that have a lot of time on their hands and they're really enthusiastic about what they're doing. However, it does also lead to some challenges because not everybody's an expert in their field. So we come into certain problems. For example, some of the stream data loggers are placed in areas of the streams with low flow versus high flow, which can lead to different um, TDS or level or temperature readings. So, so far we've been working with seven of our 36 streams that are throughout Indiana County that Evergreen Conservancy has data for. So on this graph, we see the Y axis is going to be our locations and the um, ones highlighted in red are the ones that we have worked on so far. And then the X axis is just the dates for how long um, the data has been collected for. So our first step of using um, all this data that they've been giving us is quality control. So our first um, step is going to be we're using a lot of Python to automate our process since we have a lot of data. Um, the stream data loggers have been recording every 15 to 30 minutes for 5 to uh, 12 years on every um, spot. So that leads with us a lot of data. So it's just a lot of automation. And our first step here is going to be um, telling Python to remove any data points that are outside of these um, specific ranges. And then you can see from the first to second graph, 
it changed the y-axis and made the, the data already more usable and more accurate. So our step two was to calculate our z-values to remove these outliers further. And then the third step is to calculate our rolling median to get rid of even more bad data points. And then as you can see, this one did not remove as many as the first cleaning step, but it did still remove some and made our data more accurate to work with. Um, our step four of quality control was to remove um, barometric problems with our data. So with our water level aspect, we just want the water depth. However, the stream data loggers are also recording atmospheric pressure. And so we're using data from the Pittsburgh International Airports as well as the Indiana Airport to get rid of that atmospheric pressure so we have a more accurate water level reading. So we have some beginning results for our seven streams. Um, the graphs I'm going to be showing you are going to be from Big Yellow Creek specifically because it shows a good general point of what all the other graphs tend to look like. So the first graph we have is temperature. The green line is going to be our maximum values and our purple line at the bottom is going to be our minimum and then our blue line is going to be our average values. So. For temperature, we see what we expect to see, higher temperatures in the um, summer months and then lower in the winter. Our, um, the solid line you can probably see a lot easier is going to be our like general distribution of values while the dotted points are each individual value. And then we have year-round rainfall where we are so we get to see steady um, water levels, um, the maximums are very variable and are associated with individual events, so we get to see the very flashy nature of our streams. Um, this graph also will correlate with our TDS. Um, it, so our TDS levels here are peaking in the late summer months, early fall months, and we presented this research at GSA, the Geological Society of America um, conference, just a few weeks ago, and I got some good input um, that it might be from biological activity um, but we are going to use that in the future research. We also see a peak um, in late um, winter in March, and that is probably from just one specific event, but it, we hypothesize it might just be from road salt runoff. So this is like the phase one of our um, project. So we're going to be working a lot in the future with calc we're going to go out in the field and calculate discharge using this um, cut stream cross section that you see on the screen and then we're also going to be working with colleagues we hopefully can work with the geography and chemistry departments to really analyze what is in the streams and what is causing those certain TDS peaks and then we're going to again we're going to be looking um, into working with chemistry to answer our questions that we have so far. And that is all I have, so I'll take any questions. And this QR code is for the Evergreen Conservancy website if anyone is interested in looking up about what they're about. Yeah. Do you know if you have the ability to measure uh, dissolved organic carbon as, as part of that? Total solids thing and you know, maybe biological sources or so I think with our stream um, loggers that we have now, we couldn't do that, but that would require us going out into the field um, and getting our data. Yeah. We don't have that ability right now, no. Yeah. I mean, we do if we went out and took water samples, but on this legacy data set that we sort of acquired this last year, um, we don't have that ability. Thank you.
Okay, our next speaker is Meredith Barney from the Watershed Conservation Research Center at Allegheny College. All right, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be presenting on evaluating the long-term success of two stream bank restorations within the French Creek watershed. So one of our previous presenters highlighted French Creek a little bit, but French Creek is about 117 miles long and it spans multiple counties. It flows into the Allegheny and it's really known for its high biodiversity. It's home to over 80 species of fish, including our native brook trout, as well as 15 species of darters. 27 freshwater mussels call it home, four of which are federally endangered and two are listed at the state level. We also have our smaller friends, our macroinvertebrates, our newts, our salamanders, our frogs, and then our larger mammals. So while it's extremely biodiverse, it is no stranger to having environmental stressors. So the area is known for a lot of logging and clear cut as well as agriculture. So naturally that causes some issues regarding erosion, which then leads to runoff and then can add additional sediment into our waterways, which can disrupt the overall productivity of an ecosystem. Some of that runoff can also be agricultural based, so adding unneeded additional nutrients into the water, causing algal blooms. And then we also had some round gobies stuff earlier, but it's an invasive that's starting to make its way into French Creek. And so the goal with our restoration work is to try and mitigate some of these stressors in order to preserve the integrity and the diversity of French Creek. And so our two restoration sites were within the French Creek watershed. Um, they were on Woodcock Creek, which flows into the main stem of French Creek. It's about 40 minutes south of where we are now. Um, but our first site was on the main stem of Woodcock, which I'll refer to as Craig Road. Our second site is on a small um, unnamed tributary flowing into Woodcock, which I'll refer to as Telly Ho. Both of these sites are located near the dam, and we have done some restoration work in the past regarding, regarding culvert replacements, which improves the aquatic passability and overall flow of the stream. And so looking at our first restoration site, um, this one was completed in August of 2022. And these are from before the restoration. So you can kind of see like that massive gravel bar in the center that the stream wasn't flowing together as one unit. It was like two separate channels on the side. This particular area also had issues with stream bank stability, sedimentation and erosion. And so what was done to kind of improve this area is a series of um, deflectors. So we had some root wad deflectors, some mud sill cribbing, as well as a stone deflector and three single lane uh, log deflectors. So the main purpose of these deflectors are to redirect the water away from the stream banks to help those erosion issues and also push the water to the center of the channel to also help with overall flow and connectivity. And so additionally, when these structures are added to a stream, they can also add beneficial undercut habitat for different fish species. And so this is our second site, which I'll refer to as Telly Ho. It was completed a lot more recently in June of 2023. Um, you can see the massive just banks on the side that are having the erosion issues. Um, also, this stream had um, some issues with connectivity and also lack of diverse habitat. And so what was done here is that the main component was adding these large wooden logs to kind of stabilize the stream and help with the issues of erosion. Um, some larger woody debris was also placed within the stream to help diversify the habitat and again add that undercut habitat for fish species. So with our stream bank restorations, um, we hypothesize that they're going to cause long-term improvements to the overall biotic integrity, water quality, and habitat heterogeneity, as well as increased recruitment of new species and also ones that are more sensitive. 
And so in order to um, evaluate our restorations, we performed a series of restorations pre and post, um, looking at the same stretch of stream to look for changes. And so here are some of the variables that we collected, the first being a fish survey. So we performed backpack electrofishing and identified all caught species. We looked at macroinvertebrates, collected them from different habitat types, identified them back in the lab, and then followed DEP protocols to I calculate a biotic integrity score. And then we did water chemistry, so pH, temperature, turbidity, dissolved oxygen, alkalinity, and hardness. And then we did a series of assessments regarding the habitat, so the riparian vegetation surrounding the area, but also measurements of the actual channel structure. We also did biweekly water sampling to look for um, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, but also bacteria such as E. coli. And then finally, we, did, we took hydrologic measurements of the stream, including sediment, substrate material, and just overall water quality and water velocity. And so there's a lot of different parameters here, so I'm just gonna focus on the fish diversity and abundance and the macroinvertebrates. And so beginning with our first restoration site of Craig Road, pre-restoration we had a total of two samples where 31 different species were caught, eight of those which were darters. The dominant family was the Persidae family with the fantail and the rainbow appearing most common. The second highest family was the Cyprinidae family with the rosy faced shiner being caught the most often. So some species that we found pre-restoration but not post-restoration, so we lost them to the restoration, include the pumpkin seed, the long-nosed dace, and the rainbow trout. Moving to post-restoration, um, we had a total of five samples this time where we saw, uh, we added six new species for 37 and one new darter species. The dominant family was pretty similar with the rainbow and the fantail appearing most common, but we did see a large increase in our Catasomidae family or our suckers. We added two new species of red horse and some other new families in fish that we saw include the largemouth bass, the spotted darter, and the bowfin. And so looking at the macroinvertebrates, Again, we calculated an index of biotic integrity for pre and post restoration. We didn't really see any big trends or improvements um, in then looking specifically at the average scores. They were fairly similar for pre and post restoration. The most dominant taxa were the chironomids. Um, they were similar distributions, about 41% pre and 38% post. And so now we'll move on to our second restoration site, which was completed more recently at Tele Ho. And so pre-restoration, we had three samples, uh, 14 species, three of those which are darters. The Cyprinidae family was most common with the black nose days and the central stone roller being caught. And some fish that we found pre-restoration but did not find post-restoration include the northern hog sucker, the yellow bullhead catfish, the red side dace, the pumpkin seed, and the variegate darter. And so post restoration, we saw a similar but slightly different distribution. We had three samples, but we found two less species this time and a similar number of darters. The black nosed dace and the stone roller again dominated in the Cyprinidae family, but we saw a large increase in our mottled sculpted population. Some new species that we found post-restoration include the rainbow darter, the blunt-nosed minnow, and the striped shiner. And then again, looking at the macroinvertebrates, pre and post, there weren't any real trends. However, there was a slight decrease in the average biotic integrity post-restoration. The dominant taxa was again your chironomids, but we did see a large increase in this taxa post-restoration. And so looking at what this means, it's important to remember that both of these restorations are still fairly new. Craig Road is about one year out regarding our monitoring, but we did see an increase in fish diversity. 
we saw six new species, um, but we did lose important species such as the pumpkin seed and the trout. Um, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. It could be directly attributed to the restoration, so adding those deflectors, um, just diversifying the habitat, recruiting larger species. Um, but we have to remember that this site is really close to the Woodcock Dam, which is regulated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. So they're kind of controlling the outflow of fish so that could cause seeing new species certain times and then not seeing species at different times. Our addition of the darter could be attributed to increased and better water quality conditions. Um, darters are a very sensitive fish species, um, so with decreased sediment, that could be a reason why we added a new one, but we need to cross-check that with some of our water quality data. Um, the minimal changes in macroinvertebrates are likely just due to the recency of the construction. It's likely just taking more time for those sensitive EPT species to return to the area. And then looking at Tele Hill, this site is even more recent than Craig Road. We're only about three months out. And we did lose two um, fish species post-restoration. We saw a slight decline, but we're attributing that to the construction. The construction was a major disturbance for the area. And when we were doing the restoration, one of the goals was to restore the overall stream connectivity. So we did lose some of the larger pools that maybe the catfish and the hog sucker would have occupied. Um, we did see a lot of younger fish in smaller age classes, so we're hoping eventually they'll continue to grow and recolonize the area. The increase of the modeled sculpin is likely just due to the species resiliency. It can handle a lot of stressors and also less than <coughs> ideal water quality. So with those parameters and also less larger fish species, it kind of explains why that population was able to grow. And then, similarly with the macroinvertebrates, we saw a small decrease in diversity, um, but we did see a increase in the chironomids. And so chironomids are not a sensitive species, so that kind of shows how the area is probably still experiencing issues with water quality and sedimentation. So again, it's just taking more time for the sensitive species to return. And so we're still really hopeful that recolonization is going to occur in this area. We had a really dry um, summer and fall, so we're hoping with the upcoming seasons there might be more precipitation to help return and restore some of those larger pools so some of those bigger fish species can return and also maybe recruit some additional species. And so looking at some similar studies, um, both of these two right up here right now they both cited about a two or three year delay in fish diversity responses to the restoration. And then specifically, the second study was similar to our Tele Ho site, where there was a decrease in diversity in year one, but then by years two and three, there was an increase. Specifically with the macroinvertebrates, it was pretty similar. Um, the study found that in Year one, there was less sensitive species, but it took about a year or two for those more sensitive EPT taxa to return. And so what are our future plans? So I mentioned a lot of different data parameters at the beginning um, regarding sediment, nutrients, water quality, and substrate material. So that's a lot of data that we still need to go through and see how they interact and see what they mean for the restoration. We also want to continue to monitor both of these sites, Telly Hollow and Craig Road. Uh, I think we have about five years of planning in our minds to see those long-term changes. And then we do have some future restorations planned, so hopefully we can take what we've learned from these early restorations and then apply it um, to these restorations. They're both within Woodcock Creek still. We have a Stainbrook Park site and then various culverts within the area. And so I'd like to thank anyone who supported me or aided in this research, and I'll open it up to questions. We have time for questions. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is there any way to get involved in the restoration efforts? Um, 
Well, we work a little, um, a lot with our students at Allegheny College, um, but I think, you know, if you're interested or in the area, that could be something we could explore, you know, there's a lot of work that goes into it, but you'd have to go through like some training to help us out. Do you know who actually does the restoration? Is that contracted out or is that um, like fish and boat? I believe it's PennDOT. It's uh, so we work closely with the Crawford County Conservation District um, with permitting, <laughs> lots of permitting. And then um, fishing with the permit that we do is in stream habitat improvement. Um, and so fish and boat can do like all the blueprints and all of them. It's just, yeah, some environmental group whoever gets the list of it, yeah. But the, the Crawford County Conservation District has been helpful because they have small pots of money and then we have some money and so we can combine it to do bigger projects. Um, and so that's kind of been our goal with collaborating with other like, conservation-minded organizations is that everybody has a little bit of money, but if we strategically pull it together, we can get bigger projects done. Oh, yep, go ahead. Sure, the picture of the, it was the Telego site, that big yeah. cut bank. Yeah. Do you know what the, the sufficient material out of there? Um, like they use for the restoration? Yeah. Is it like plus to not wash in I know that it all washed down the stream at the end of the, um, the, um, yeah. like the <laughs> Woodcock, the township actually took it all out of the stream and then used it, <laughs> used okay. it on road and stuff, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, that the amount of erosion from that site significantly changed how Woodcock Street flowed. I mean, it was. I mean, you can see how much erosion was there. And um, it, yeah. So it, it will be really interesting to see now that this is hopefully not washing away as much. What the changes will be downstream in terms of sedimentation. But it's the, the restoration was in channel, so the channel has been sized. It's basically made a new floodplain. So. The channel wasn't reconnected to the old floodplain. You just put the structures in the modern channel. You're just trying to reduce interaction with all that stuff. Yes, exactly. Even that modern, modern, that modern channel you're saying is like still a modern channel because everything to the left, the channel used to flow even farther to the left in that picture. Yeah. And so, because of how much water and erosion occurs, that's like a really dynamic stream in terms of that its channel has changed. Yeah, we don't know like, the specifics of the underlying geology. Uh, okay. I, just, I remember Woodcock Dam was actually drained at one point in time. So do you think a lot of that erosion came from when it was drained on accident or um, this one this one is a tributary yeah. before Woodcock and oh, okay. um, so this one would not have been affected okay. by the draining by the yeah. draining of the lake. Okay. But, uh, if we would have seen like a whole bunch of increase in game fish after yeah. the dams release and stuff like that, of course then we will have seen it. some things are probably washing through, but yeah, this happened because of a lot of land use changes upstream. So okay. this property, they're farmers, they're losing all of their farm fields basically to this. Um, and there's a couple housing developments upstream, a giant beaver dam got removed upstream, a couple culverts have one culvert has been replaced, and so there's, unfortunately, they just live on the bottom part of the watershed, and so everything, yeah, they, yeah, they are certainly having some issues. Did you have a question? Yeah, you've spent time in, in these streams. I, I think of the streams up here, and they're all boring. They have these long yeah. stretches of bedrock, right, mm -hmm. and scoured down to that along the lake here. These, what are these streams like? Do they have long stretches of bedrock, or do you? Uh, yeah, they have a little bit of, um, there's a little bit of rocks down here at the bottom, um, but they do have um, some diversified, diversified habitat in it. Stop disparaging rocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just think of these long, 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 long
Yeah, it's exactly shale. Yeah, it's shale. Yeah. It's right on the shelf. It gets really slippery. I know that when you get those streams. That's great for things living in the street. I'll give you that. Thank you, Mary. All right, so we will take a break before our last session. Help yourself to any of the snacks or drinks in the back of the room, and we will resume at 1.50.
everybody we are going to go ahead and get started with our final session please take your seats um, our first presenter of this session is going to be Zachary Breeden from the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine Hi, I'm Zach Breeden. Uh, from, I'm a second year from Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. I'm presenting the effects of repeat administration of intranasal uh, gentamicin on the vestibular function in affiliation with my lab partner, Leanne, and Dr. Yusra Mansour and Dr. Randy Teleza. So first, I want to provide a little bit of an introduction to the antibiotic gentamicin. It is an aminoglycoside. It, it has bactericidal activity against gram-negative bacteria. And specifically, the mechanism of action of this antibiotic is inhibition of bacterial 30S ribosomal subunits. And now, the reason we chose gentamicin is because it's clinically significant and used commonly in infections frequently like sinus infections and things like that. And the reason we chose our intranasal approach is because there's limited literature on the side effect profile when correlating that to an intranasal administration. And the literature does pr uh, show already that there's a concrete relation between IV and IM administrations. And then some common adverse effects to note are rash, inflammation, drowsiness, weakness, and most importantly, and most worrisome, ototoxicity, which is hearing loss. And then for the purposes of this study and this presentation, we hypothesize that the intranasal administration of gentamicin will result in ototoxicity and impaired vestibular function. Now to introduce the vestibular system. The function of the vestibular system is pretty simple. It's going to correct posture and head positioning relative to gravity. Um, and we get some input and correction via the cerebellum and the vestibulospinal tracts. And if we have lesions to this system anywhere along its path, you could see symptoms like dizziness, nystagmus, and ataxia. So now to go a little bit more in depth on the pathway and relate it to our vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, which I'll be presenting some results on later on in this, in this presentation. Um, first, we kind of start with a sound stimulus here in the image. And this will activate the cells, the macula and cristae of the inner ear, and specifically the macula in the utricle in the saccule. And important to note that loud noises specifically activate saccular hair cells. And then we also have cristae in our semicircular canals, which are depicted as P, H, and A. These are posterior, anterior, and horizontal semicircular canals. And then generically, this arrow is just depicting whereabouts we have these cells. So once these cells are activated, we traverse via the vestibular nerve. We will go through a vestibular ganglia and reach the vestibular nuclei. These nuclei are found throughout the cerebellum and the pons of the brainstem. And then we will traverse up and down the lateral and medial vestibular spinal tracts through the brainstem and the cervical spinal cord. And then we will, receive, we will get to a final destination here at the cervical musculature where we will finally make those corrections for head positioning relative to gravity. Now to introduce our methods. I want to point your attention down to figure A here, where uh, P0 just represents post-embryonic day zero, so this is right after birth. Uh, we have a period of two weeks in which the rats that we expose are allowed to age, and then we start handling these rats for six days. So post-embryonic day 15, we start handling our rats, and then we, after our six-day handling period, we move on to our intranasal irrigation. This is done with a control group where they receive a saline solution in the prep is seen as such, and then also our exposure group which they receive a gentamicin solution. The uh, dosage for a gentamicin solution is standardized to that of what a human would receive, but scaled super far down to what a rat would receive. 
And then we split this dose in half and we give half dose in one nostril and then the other half in the other nostril. And then so far our sample size is 26 and our project is still ongoing. So again, half will be control and half gentamicin and then we further split these groups into male and female. And then figure B just shows a overview representation including our handling and exposure period and then also our whole battery of testing which encompasses physical and neurophysiologic testing for our rats. So first, I want to start talking about the methods for the gait analysis. This is done at post-embryonic, day 33. And what we do with this is we paint the front and the back paws of the rat uh, different colors. So the front will receive like red, for example, seen over here, and then the back would be brown. And then we have them walk across a thin sheet of paper, and we will do measurements like hind width which for example, you could see here on this image. And then we will also do step length measurements for the forelimbs and then also the hind limbs as well. And this is done bilaterally. And then here's an example of what one of the right hind limb measurements might look like. Next, we move on to post-embryonic day 34 where we do negative geotaxis uh, testing. So this apparatus, we just have an inclined uh, platform here and we place them snout down. So the rat feels like they're falling forward which should activate the vestibular system to say, hey, we feel like we're falling over, we should probably turn around and not do that. So what that means is our trial for this test would be complete when the rat then faces up in this direction, and then we would do that in triplicate and take the average of those results. And then also on that day, we do rotor rod training, which is done on this rotary apparatus here, where we would place the rat on the black cylinder, and we would just set it for a non-accelerating setting, and they would move forward for five minutes. And we basically the purpose of us in this aspect is we need to make sure they're facing the right direction and they understand where they need to go. And now the very next day at post-embryonic day 35, we do the testing that follows that training. So the rotor rod testing is slightly different in which the platform now accelerates. So again, there will be a five minute cap on this where if they make, make the five minutes, their trial is complete. And if they fall off, that's the termination of the trial and that will be the result. And also on this day, we do a writing reflex. This is gonna examine the vestibular apparatus and it's more of a reflexive motion and then I have a video to show how this works here. So we pin the rat with all fours down and then we do a, um, a video analysis for the time it takes for them to come back to all fours. And then next on post-embryonic day 36, we do postural instability testing. The purpose of this, again, is a physical test for the vestibular function, but we're gonna restrain the forelimb bilaterally and do a whole testing circuit on this. And the video here will show an example of that. So in this video, we're restraining the left forelimb and having them walk. And the purpose of the ruler is that we're measuring the distance the snout will traverse before the rat takes another step. And then on post-embryonic day 37, we do another trial of negative geotaxis, which is the same as described prior. And also, we start our balance beam training. So the balance beam training, basically we have a rod here where the, there will be a fixed distance of 40 centimeters that the rat will have to traverse eventually. But first with our training period, we start by placing the rat into a dark hut where they start to feel comfortable, they understand it's safe. And then as the training period progresses, we move them further and further back on the rod so that they understand that when placed on the rod, they need to move forward and reach the hut. And then the next day, post-embryonic 38, we do the same training period for that balance beam. And then we finally get to our testing period on post-embryonic day 39 for that. So we have baseline and vestibular uh, testing on this um, physical uh, test. So the baseline testing, we just place them on the rod and they run into the hut. It's similar to the training period. There's no challenge applied, but they need to traverse that fixed distance of 40 centimeters from the starting spot to the finish spot. And then with our vestibular test, we spin them around in a cup for 20 seconds and then we place them back on the rod and we see how this vestibular challenge would affect the outcome of the test. So I'm gonna show you a video of both. So first is our baseline test where we place the rat and they just run straight into the hut. So this next video I'm gonna show you is the same exact rat, and it is a gentamicin exposed rat, and this will be after their vestibular challenge. And with this testing, we will do time trials, and the video analysis is also there for slip counts. So we also quantify to see if there was any difference in slips in the control versus gentamicin groups. And now we move on to the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, which I uh, introduced earlier on with that long pathway. 
Uh, in the top right here, we have a live image of how this may look. And our breathing mask here has our isofluorine anesthesia to keep the rat under. And then our figure down here in the bottom left shows us where our recording electrode is in the deep neck muscles. And then we have a reference electrode in the snout and a ground electrode in one of the hind limbs. And then, as you can see here, we have a speaker that will play a 10 kilohertz tone to activate the vestibular system at 512 repetitions for at 70 decibels. And then here is just an example readout to introduce what it may look like, and we will go into this more later on once we talk about the results. And then we have ABR testing, our auditory brainstem, which my partner presented on Wednesday during the poster session. So just an overview on this, it is broadband clicks and tones that are played at five decibel increments and completed for a range of 90 to 10 decibels. So then here's an example comparison of our cartoon diagrams here where we have our vestibular evoked at post-embryonic 40 and our ABRs at post-embryonic 41. And one of the main differences to note is the electrode placement, but then also that with the ABRs, these electrodes are placed subdermally where our recording electrode with the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials are in the deep neck muscles. And then not in this presentation, but further studies that are ongoing, we do harvest the brains afterwards to do a anatomical and histologic analysis of the brains and brain stem of these rats. And first we make sure the rats are fully under and we, then we perfuse them using the ascending aorta with a normal saline solution to flush out any red cells. And then we follow the fixative solution as seen here. And then the purpose of this is to quantify and look at morphology of neurons of the spiral ganglia and central auditory neurons. So now to talk about some of our results. So I'll play this video just as a reminder of what our writing reflex is. And when we did this uh, analysis, we did not find any significant findings here. Some of the gentamicin rats may be a little bit slower, but there was nothing significant, significant that came of this physical test. And now on to postural instability. So this test, again, a video reminder of what this test looked like. There was no significant difference between groups, control versus exposure. Uh, but what is important to note is that in the green here are gentamicin rats their steps were more frequent. So as we restrained their high limbs and progressed them across the platform, they felt like they were falling over more frequent and they were like, hey, I should probably take a step, otherwise I'm gonna hit the ground. So they did take steps more frequent and this was important to note about that. And now the negative geotaxis. Again, no significant difference between groups, but what is important to note here and notice on our, our graph is that when we did our second trial on post-embryonic day 37, both groups do show improvements. So although nothing significant, what is important to note is that when you do a baseline test like negative geotaxis, our control group and our exposed group perform just about the same with any significant hindrance. And now our rotor rod. Again, this is our accelerating platform where the rat will have to stay on for five minutes and if they fall off, their trial will be concluded. And we did have a, a significant difference here with our gentamicin rats. They fell off more frequent and more often than that of the control group. And another aspect of our physical test, our balance beam testing, which was shown in those uh, two comparison videos prior, our slip quantity analysis did not show any significant result between control and exposed groups, and then also that between baseline and vestibular testing. But what I do wanna point out is that when we do our baseline testing for the time it takes to complete that challenge to reach that hut once placed at the starting point, uh, at baseline, they were about the same. But when we spin them around in the cup and we challenge their vestibular system, the vestibular or the gentamicin exposed rats did see a two to four fold increase in the time it took to complete that challenge. And it was pretty evident in what we saw in the example video I provided earlier. So now back to the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. So this uh, diagram is a little bit more colorful than the last one we saw. But reason being, our gray line represents our control group and the green line represents the gentamicin group. And some important landmarks that we want to point out that will be a part of our analysis is the onset, which is basically when that vestibular activation starts to peak up and we get a positive slope in our curve. And then P1 is just our peak amplitude of the curve. And then our N1 is basically the offset of that vestibular response. And now to look at those landmarks specifically. When we compare our control and gentamicin groups, our P1 activation was about the same. There was really no significant difference between groups, but something that is important to note is that when we look at the onset of the vestibular response, 
Our control group was pretty normal, but our gentamicin group did see a delayed um, activation of the vestibular response, and this was a significant finding for us. And similarly, the offset of the vestibular activation, seen at N1 here, um, the control group had a normal offset, but our offset of the vestibular activation in the gentamicin group was significantly delayed. So when we combine those two findings and we look at the overall response with the onset and offset being later in the gentamicin group, it does show that that overall activation response is significantly longer than that of a control rat. And then just to summarize, our gentamicin exposed rats do perform just as well on several tests. This was seen in plenty of our uh, physical testing. And some of our physical testing that did yield some significant results, just as a reminder, the rotor rod. Again, this is more of a challenge. There's an accelerating platform, and our gentamicin rats did not fare as well on that challenge. And then also, when we applied the vestibular challenge with the balance beam testing, when we spun them around in the cup to challenge the vestibular system. And then furthermore, our neurophysiological testing, where we did our vestibular evoked myogenic potentials, this was consistent with that of an abnormal activation of the vestibular brainstem, and our anatomic and histological studies will help, hopefully help to further understand why this is significant. But overall, between our physical and neurophysiologic testing, uh, these findings do suggest that intranasal administration of gentamicin significantly impacts the structure and function of the vestibular system. Any questions? Some of the rats, their tails have like odd colors to them. Um, we do have markings on them. We, we use um, like Sharpie markers, uh, blue, red, or black, green, whatever we kind of have available. And we stay consistent with that. We mark it in our notebook. And so if, if there's like an abnormality on the tail, it's probably just some of the Sharpie. Also, why would that other one, well, why would that one person holding that rat to help them balance? For, oh, so that's the postural instability testing. So if I go back here, um, so the, again, the purpose of this analysis was to restrain one of the limbs so that we see how far the rat would move before they take another step to basically be like, how far are you going to move before you feel like you're falling forward and you need to take another step? So that was kind of the purpose of this test here. Yep. Um, so. Part of uh, another input, sensory input, would be eyesight. So would there, what do you think the impacts would be if he did this again and then also blindfolded the rats? Do you think their eyesight's compensating th them a little bit if there is any impacts to their balance? Um, it is a good question. I'm not entirely sure, but some of our testing does include nystagmus testing, which does include the visual circuit. Um, we don't have any results for that test quite yet, but it is an interesting point to observe, yes. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Do you have a hypothesis on like, what mechanism would cause some of these uh, changes in, in stability and uh, not others? Uh, like, like between tests? Of the, like some part of the inner ear is being affected and other parts are not? Or... Um, I'm not quite sure, but that's also why we have our ongoing histological studies, is to look at different aspects of this pathway and see if there's any difference in quantity or morphology and structure of the, the neurons and, and some of that pathway there. Any further questions? Thank you. Um, we are going to move right along with our next presentation. We have Megan Greca from the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. If I can find where the mouse is. I'm Meg Greca. I am a second year student at LECOM, and today I'll be presenting on some of the work I've been doing in Dr. Randy Colazzo's lab, uh, the impact of in utero paracetamol exposure on vestibular and auditory function. 
So paracetamol, or AKA Tylenol, as you may know it better, um, is an over-the-counter analgesic and antipyretic medication. Uh, as of right now, it's considered the safest over-the-counter pain relief option to be used during pregnancy. Um, when taken during pregnancy, it does reach the fetus. Uh, both paracetamol, or PAR, and its metabolites reach it through placental transfer, but as of right now, this drug is still considered safe for use during pregnancy. However, there has been some epidemiological data that has been published to uh, correlate maternal Tylenol exposure um, and the risk for development of conditions such as autism and ADHD. Um, so these neurodevelopmental disorders, which um, as you may be familiar with, often exhibit uh, behavioral abnormalities such as repetitive behaviors or poor social skills or communication deficits, um, and then auditory and vestibular dysfunction. And so the latter there, the auditory and vestibular dysfunction, is really what we are focusing on here um, in our studies with Tylenol. So we used a rat model. The rats were mated using timed uh, breeding, and then uh, embryonic day zero was noted with the presence of a vaginal plug. And then from there, starting on embryonic day six, the rats were gavaged, so a tube um, down into their stomach. Uh, with Tylenol or the vehicle which was water. Uh, the Tylenol that we gave them was 350 milligrams per kilogram of the rat's weight, which is equivalent to approximately 500 milligrams per day in a human. So here's the testing schedule that was followed um, after the rats were born. The first thing on the list there is handling. So from postnatal days 15 to 20, the rats were all handled by me or someone else in the lab who would be helping with the motor test so that they would be more comfortable with us as we proceeded into some of the motor tests. Another thing that we looked at was the timing of ear opening. So we looked at when the kind of piece of skin that covers uh, the ear opened up so that we could see uh, the entire way in. And as you can see here, there was a delay in the ear opening here in the Tylenol exposed group there in the pink. Um, and so this table here on the right is comparing the percent of ears open on postnatal day 14. The reason for that being that no, none of the Tylenol exposed ears were open until day 14. So in order to compare them and run stats, um, we used the data from that day and using a Fisher's exact test found that uh, these were significantly different. Okay, the first uh, testing on the schedule was the rotor rod testing. And so using this apparatus here on the right, for uh, one day the rats were trained at a constant speed walking on the rod. And then the following day we did their testing. So the uh, rod sped up as the test went on. And for a five minute interval period, we just timed how long the rats lasted. The control uh, over in the gray uh, most of those rats lasted the full five minute period or 300 uh, seconds and there was a drop off in that time for the Tylenol rats with none of them lasting the whole five minute period. Next was a negative geotaxis. So the rats were placed snout down on that block uh, that's at a 45 degree angle and we timed the, how long it took for them to flip back around to be facing upward and there was an increased latency in the time to turn in the Tylenol exposed rats as well. And then for the writing reflex, as you saw the video in Zach's presentation, but here just depicted in pictures, we also found that there was a significant increase in flipping latency for the Tylenol exposed rats. Um, then moving on to the vestibular evoked uh, myogenic potentials or VEMPs. Um, with the <coughs> schematic here, you can see that the recording electrode is placed in the paraspinal muscles above the neck and then the um, reference electrode up by the right snout and the grounding electrode by the left hind limb. And then we have the generic output uh, pictured here and some of the things that we are looking at were the onset, uh, the amplitude of the first peak, the width of the response, and then um, the latency as well of peak one, the first positive peak, and then N1, which was the negative uh, trough there. So here's the results for the vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. Um, from left to right in figure A is the latency of onset and uh, P1, uh, or that first positive peak, and so there were no significant differences 
there, uh, nor were there significant differences for the amplitude of that positive peak or the latency. Um, but if you look at the latency of the uh, negative peak, that's where we saw a significant e increase. And so that would be the negative trough, and then also a significant increase in the Tylenol group for the total response width. And then moving on to the auditory brainstem responses. So this was kind of a similar setup to the VEMPs with the um, recording electrode uh, placed in the center there over the auditory midbrain and then the reference electrodes behind the ears. And so the outputs of these look something like this generic schematic that I have up there with each of the waves uh, corresponding to a different part of the ascending auditory pathway. Uh, wave one being the spiral ganglion, wave two being the cochlear nucleus, three being the superior olivary complex, four the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus, and five the inferior folliculus. So something that we noticed with the Tylenol groups when we were looking at the ABR results was that there seemed to be a stratification in that some of them appeared to be completely fine, um, especially as we looked at wave five in the ABRs, and some of them uh, seemed to be <clears throat> excuse me, significantly impacted. Um, and so in order to uh, really dive into this, we then stratify the data into two different groups. As you'll see here from now on, we'll have two different Tylenol groups. The PAR E, the PAR exposed group, so those that were exposed but unaffected or uh, the same as the control, and then the PAR A group, the Tylenol exposed group that did experience um, significant deficits. And so the way this data was stratified was based um, like I said, on the wave five latency. And so anything above um, the 90th percentile for wave five uh, was on the PAR E group, and then anything below PAR A. So these are some representative outputs here, and the arrows show how we determine the uh, threshold. So the threshold will be where um, we stop seeing waves. Um, and so for the ABR is done on postnatal day 21. Here are some representatives. And then again on postnatal day 29, and as you can see, um, there's an increased threshold here in the part A group. And then here um, are some representative thresholds um, in the control and part E groups. So these um, are just superimposed now that we can, so we can look at them um, in comparison to each other. Um, in figures A and C are the 70 decibel recordings for uh, days 21 and 29. Um, and then at the bottom here, this is the recording for each rat um, at 20 decibels above their threshold so that they were all normalized to each rat's hearing threshold. And here you can see a little better um, the increased latency in the waves here in that uh, dark pink uh, Tylenol affected group. Um, so here are the results for the first day, P21, of the auditory brainstem responses. Um, so starting from figure A, as you can see, there's an increased threshold in the PAR A group in comparison to the uh, control and the PAR E groups. And then uh, we looked at the latencies of each of the waves, and um, most notably we have the increased latency in wave four, and then in wave five, and then the increased uh, interwave latency for between waves one to wave five. And we saw some similar results on the recordings done on uh, day 29, where we see the threshold. Um, and so what does that mean? Uh, just basically that they can't hear as well with the increased threshold. Um, and then the same type of patterns where we saw an increase in wave three, wave four, and wave five latency um, in the Tylenol exposed groups. So what does this all mean? Um, in conclusion, just to summarize, we saw that the Tylenol exposed animals had a decreased rotor rod testing time and an increased time for the negative geotaxis and the writing reflex. And then we also saw with the vestibular and auditory test that they had longer latencies, um, especially exacerbated near their hearing threshold. So overall, this suggests that the in utero exposure to the paracetamol affects the development of the inner ear and or the brain stem and then um, suggest that further research may be necessary to really evaluate if Tylenol is actually safe to take during pregnancy. Thank you.
I don't want to say explain, but be connected to why so many like, neurodivergent people have auditory processing disorder? Yeah, so I think this um, probably doesn't explain it. I think a lot of that has been established already. Some other work that we've done in our lab is using valproic acid exposure, which is um, a known cause um, of autism, ADHD, things of that nature. Um, when taken during pregnancy. And so what we saw here were a lot of the same and even some worse deficits that were seen in the VPA models. But there, yeah, there are definite connections um, in the vestibular auditory processing pathways. What's a rotor rod? A rotor rod? Yeah. Um, that was the, I can go back to the picture. Um, this was the rotor rod, and so that black part in the middle um, is where the rat is standing, and it, this will just spin around in circles, and they walk on it. It's like a little, like, okay. hamster wheel, essentially, but we control the speed. <laughs> okay, I just want to know what that, uh, that did there, or what we're on. Yeah. Um, I apologize if you uh, mentioned this in the beginning, but was it just one dosage of the Tylenol, or was it multiple, and did it matter at what time the Tylenol was given? Um, yeah, so starting at uh, embryonic day six, and then up until they gave birth, we gave it to them every single day. Every day. Yeah, right. and it was within a window, um, in a three to four hour window at the same time every day. Was there any impacts to the adult? Not that we noted. Um, since they were already used for the experiment, the mothers were unfortunately um, sacrificed at the end of the weaning period. So, okay. Thank you. We are going to take a brief pause before we start the next presentation just to keep time for anybody that might be tuning into our live stream online. Um, so I will introduce the next talk shortly.
everybody. We are going to continue with our session. I would like to introduce the next speaker, Madison Heater from Gannon University. My name is Madison Heater, and for those of you who don't know me, I work at Gannon University in the COVID-19 lab. I am the lab manager and the contact tracing supervisor. And some of you may have known some of the work that we've been doing in the lab over the last year and a half or so, but I have a little bit of an update with a specific emphasis on gene the genomic surveillance because that's arguably some of the most important work that we get to do in the lab at Gannon University. So I kind of want to just start by discussing the timeline that we all have known and lived through since 2019 and how much our protocols have changed over time um, and what those protocols are now because we've seen so many changes. I think it's important to inform you guys about what you can do um, if you are sick with COVID-19 or you have been exposed to someone with COVID-19. So first off, if you've been exposed to someone who has had COVID-19 and you're considered a close contact, which means you're around someone for 15 minutes or longer within six feet and they became um, infected and tested positive, you should monitor your symptoms for the next uh, five to 10 days. If you develop any symptoms, I highly recommend that A, you take a rapid or B, you go get a PCR. And I'll kind of talk about the recommended methods and what you should do depending um, on your timeline in a little bit here. Otherwise, if you test positive for COVID-19 and you have no symptoms, after day five, you can end your isolation period and you can go back about your business, um, especially if you have a negative test. Getting a negative test first is always recommend recommended, but not everyone can do that. Um, second, if you have a moderate to severe infection and you have symptoms after day five, it's recommended that usually you wear a mask through your day 10 to avoid getting anyone else infected unless you have a negative test. So those are the things that are recommended from the CDC and also in our policies through Gannon University. Tests that you guys take that you get the results within 15 minutes and then PCR testing, which is what we do at Gannon University in the lab. So your PCR test is gonna be the most accurate. The PCR testing is able to pick up um, any sort of viral load at the beginning of your infection or towards the end of your infection. Um, and it is sensitive in that nature. So on a rapid test or antigen test at home, you may not test positive until day one or two of symptoms. Whereas with a PCR, we may be able to pick up on those first few days of infection when you have symptoms that um, an antigen test wouldn't necessarily be able to pick up on. So that's why we always recommend a PCR test if you're able to go and take one. I wanna talk a little bit about how we can analyze in the lab if you have COVID-19 or not. So this is the PCR machine on the left and that's the machine we use in the lab. And then on the right here, this is the analysis plot that we use. So here you can see three different standards. That yellow curve is what we are gonna to consider to be positive. Typically I'll have four different standards on there. 10 to the one, 10 to the two, 10 to the three, 10 to the four. Typically, if you fall above 10 to the four, we're gonna call you positive. That means you have a high enough viral load that you could potentially get someone else sick. Um, that yellow curve up there means someone's very sick and probably very contagious and getting a lot of people sick if they haven't um, isolated themselves already. Next, I wanna talk about how we can take positive tests that we get from the community and run panels against them. So these panels are testing for specific mutations in a positive specimen. Right now we're working with eight different panels, so that's eight different specific types of mutations. Um, I know there's a lot of words up here. I don't expect anyone to understand what any of this means. And if you wanna talk more about it because it interests you, I'm happy to answer any questions. But um, a lot of these panels we have collected throughout the course of COVID-19's existence. So some of them are gonna be testing for mutations that we saw in earlier variants and subvariants, whereas some of the later ones, such as panel six, panel seven, panel eight, are gonna be looking at XBB and some of those sub lineages, which is what we're really seeing right now, those Omicron variants. 
I want to just kind of show you a phylogenetic relationship of um, COVID-19 because I think it's kind of important to put in perspective how much we are seeing COVID-19 change throughout time. So right now, up in this right-hand corner is where we're seeing a lot of our um, mutations and variants in present time. And over here is where we saw a lot of our initial um, COVID-19 infections. I was going to show you also in relationship to this last slide um, a specific website that you can go to if you're more interested in mutations so you can see shared mutations over the course of all these variants and subvariants. And if you're interested in that, I'm happy to give you the link. Unfortunately, it wasn't working in this room right now. So then here, I want to show you that after we run these panels, we're able to take these specific uh, specimen and we're able to sequence them to see these specific mutations. So right here is actually um, some of the sequencing we have done in Gannon University's lab. And as you can see up here, this was actually in March, April of 2023, so earlier this year. This is a while ago. But you can see up here there was a lot of um, clustering of Omicron variants in the ones that we sequenced. And again, just a little phylogenetic tree showing you that um, a lot of those lineages are the same throughout that period of time. Here's different um, nuclei, nucleic acids that we saw mutations of. And then also on here, you can see it tells us they're all Omicron, and that's their specific uh, lineage right there. Next, I want to talk about the trends that we're seeing currently in Pennsylvania and throughout the United States. Um, it is important to recognize that this is all going through a database that relies on people actually uh, taking the specimen and sequencing it. So this is not something that we can get real time within 12 hours. This is something that can take five plus days to do in a lab um, for a single specimen. So it does take time. There are labs that you can send specimen off to through our lab to get sequenced. Um, but here you can see the end of August. We don't have a lot of data for October yet because of how long it takes to sequence these uh, individual specimen. But over here, you can see that we have a lot of uh, different subvariants of Omicron circulating throughout the end of August in Pennsylvania. And then again, for the United States at the end of August in Pennsylvania. So something that's important to know about these uh, mutation panels and sequencing and why it's super important to uh, Erie County specifically. So one reason um, we continue to do this in our lab is because we are able to see through these mutation panels and sequencing if we are seeing a new introduction of variants and subvariants in Erie County. So actually, the Gannon University lab was the first to confirm that Omicron was in Erie County back in January of 22. That seems so long ago. Um, but we are the first to confirm that in our lab via these mutation panels because we saw a new mutation that was uh, not circulating in the population at that time. And we were able to quickly sequence those specific specimen to confirm that this indeed was Omicron in Erie County. And that actually uh, in turn allowed Erie uh, County Department of Health to initiate this press relief release and it allowed them to put out their public health measures in order to try and help the community stay safe, especially because this is around the time of Christmas and uh, New Year's, the times you're getting together with a lot of your family and maybe your elderly family. So in relationship to the Erie County Department of Health, I wanted to talk about our objectives with our uh, grant that we have with the Erie County Department of Health at Gannon University. So right now, we have four different object objectives and actually a newer objective that I'm going to touch on as well. So our first objective, obviously, is COVID-19 surveillance. surveillance. So this is taking specimen that is collected from the community from either symptomatic or non-symptomatic individuals and running them against our uh, PCR system to see if it is positive for COVID-19. So this is... We do this through Gannon University and their health center, and we also have a testing center on Gannon University's campus that allows walk-ins from the community to test them as well. So we do get some tests from the community. Then we take the positive specimen and we run them against the mutation panels for any suspected variants. 
And then in turn, we'll send out those positive specimen eventually for sequencing so we can have confirmation of the variants and recognize any potential new mutations that are found within the community. Here's kind of our workflow. This is a lot that I wanted, I felt was important to kind of include this if I'm telling you our workflow. So first we begin with the surveillance aspect, AKA we're collecting the specimen. We take that and we run the nasal pharyngeal swabs in the VDM, take it to the lab, run it on PCR. Once we confirm the positive specimen, we do our variant screening, which includes isolation of the COVID-19 positive samples, running those against the mutation panels, and then from those mutation panels, we'll do the next generation sequencing I was speaking of, so sending that off for sequencing to confirm the different um, mutations and subvariants that we're seeing within the population. Objective two is looking for co-infection within the population. So there is a very small percentage of the population that will get co-infection with either influenza A or B with COVID-19. These are our numbers from September of 22 to March of 23. As you can see, there was only two co-infected patients. So very small, small percentage, and we actually haven't seen any co-infection since March of 23. Now, we have been getting a lot less samples because I feel like a, a lot of people are less apt to test right now. Um, so having more samples, I think, would definitely help those odds of finding another co-infection. But it is interesting to know that we are seeing people who are positive for influenza A and B and or B and COVID-19. Another objective that we are focusing on is viral load post five day infection. So as I told you about the CDC guidelines, post day five is kind of that day where they allow you to either A, remove yourself from isolation, B, remove your mask and go out into the public, or C, wear a mask and go about your business. So looking at post day five infection is really important for this project because we're able to see if their viral load is going down from the beginning of their infection. So a lot of, we're finding, especially right now, post day five, a lot of people are having pretty high viral load. Um, so it is kind of scary knowing that people just leave their house, maybe not wearing a mask, going out into the public, and they're still infectious. So that's why this specific type of research is important. So we can see from post day five to day 11, what the change in viral load looks like for patients. And objective four, shout out to Sean, um, is our GIS heat maps. So each month we create heat maps with the number of positives and where they're found throughout Erie County. I try and include uh, workplace and um, home address if we have some, obviously for Gannon students, their home address is usually Gannon's campus. So uh, we do see some concentration on Gannon's campus with a lot of our focus being in the health center at Gannon. But when we do get those community members, it is important to include them on the heat map as well. So do that every month to, to kind of just highlight what we're seeing. And as you can see in October, we only had uh, five total positives. So granted we had about 72 total samples that uh, we were collected and only five of those were positive. Still important to include all of those in our data. Finally, our newest objective that I want to talk about is COVID-19 in the lake, in Lake Erie water. So with the help of RSC, we've been collecting lake water and testing that for COVID-19. I do want to note that this does not mean you can get COVID from the water. Um, this is simply us testing to see if there's any sort of trace of COVID-19 in the lake. This can be an indication of E. coli in the water or human waste, which is why it's a super important project to take on because we have seen high counts of E. coli in Lake Erie, especially along the beaches where, as you know, there's uh, recreational use and especially in the tributaries, which lead into Lake Erie. So it's important to know if we're seeing high counts there. So moving forward, how can you guys help with these projects? So mainly, we could use more tests. If you or someone you love or someone you know is sick, please, please, please tell them to get tested. Recommend that they come to our testing site so we have more uh, data and we can do more research and provide more data to the Erie County Department of Health for, their, um, for the grant. If you want to take a picture, you can write it down. Um, 
but we have walk-in testing Monday through Friday, uh, 315 to 415. This is also available on the Erie County Department of Health's website, so you can also see it up there, and it's at 406 Peachtree, Erie, PA. Um, also, if you want my phone number after this, I am happy to talk to, to you more about uh, me coming to like LeeCom if you guys want to test it. I know you guys have testing, but um, if anyone wanted me to come to the workplace and test, I'm also happy to do that. I'm trained to do so. So, A special thank you to the COVID-19 lab team, Boram and Noor, who you'll actually hear from next, uh, and then Jeanette, of course, our uh, lab director and then our previous lab interns ross and gwen they helped a lot with some of the the data that you actually saw here today and then a big thank you to the rsc staff sean and sarah for helping me with collecting water samples um, throughout the summer especially and then a special uh, thank you to our little assistant who shouted us at our beach sampling the other day miss libby nor's daughter <laughs> thank you guys <laughs> mutation that's out there right now how how does it affect us physically like is it uh, pretty dangerous is it more flu like symptoms cold like symptoms sure like that's a uh, great question I can speak to what I've seen and the few positives I've seen lately um, and from anecdotes especially with uh, contact tracing right now we're seeing <clears throat> pardon me pretty mild symptoms especially in people who are vaccinated and Flu-like symptoms, as you said, sore throat, body aches, some fevers, not always. Um, we are seeing some GI symptoms still in some patients as well. Um, and we are, again, seeing longer infections. Um, so whenever you get COVID, if you know anyone who gets COVID, highly recommend they get rest, they hydrate, and pump whatever vitamins we, they can. That's really, the rest is the main way to help you feel better, so, and kind of prevent any long-term symptoms in that sense, but just anecdotally, that's what I've been seeing. So, good question. Uh, you said you were also like looking at uh, COVID-19 rates in the water. Like, can COVID-19 travel through water? Like, can it like accumulate in the water molecules or something? So that's a good question. Usually, for seeing COVID-19 in the water, it's going to be because of human waste in the water. So not necessarily in the water molecules, but because of E. coli and potential human waste in the water. What is the current consensus on the uh, vaccination or the booster? That's the booster. Nice. Who should get it? Should good question. Um, so right now it's open to anyone and it's targeting specifically Omicron and new variants and subvariants associated with Omicron. Um, do your research, ask your do doctor if you should be getting it. Um, I'm due for mine soon, so I'm gonna be going to get mine soon because I'm eligible, but obviously if you're elderly or immunocompromised, it's recommended. Um, but talk to your doctor and see what they say and get uh, an opinion of a medical professional. <laughs> So viruses are known to evolve very quickly, and we have this span of time from when COVID started till now. Do they evolve quickly in the beginning, or are they evolving more quickly now, or do you think it's been kind of steady evolution till now? Um, I think, this is my personal opinion, it's been pretty steady, but uh, you should know that this, let me show you this graphic again. This phylogenetic uh, tree doesn't even have half the subvariants that we're seeing. Um, there are tons of mutations out there. There are tons of subvariants to subvariants that would never fit on this phylogenetic tree because there's so many of them. So just know that if you're not hearing of a new big uh, variant of concern out there, there's still variants that are um, evolving for COVID. So always evolving quickly for sure. The Delta variant, the only one that we're seeing where we lose our taste and smell? No. Good. Yeah. So, actually, there's a specific mutation associated with Delta that we started seeing circulate again in the population where people are losing their taste and smell again. So, it was very interesting when I started seeing that specific symptom come back because I was nervous that Delta was back and it ended up being just another mutation in Omicron that we were seeing circulate in the population again. So, 
I wish I could tell you. I wish I didn't, because that's as if being sick isn't rude enough. You take my taste and smell through. <laughs> Anyone else? We are just about out of time for questions. Perfect. Speakers, we have Borum Choi and Noor Masri from Gannon University. Hi, my name is Noor Masri. Uh, I'm a public health uh, science major. I'm presenting with my lab partner, Boram Choi, understanding key factors in managing COVID-19 and related pandemics. Uh, in the beginning, I wanna talk a little bit about coronaviruses and mostly SARS-CoV-2, uh, oh, sorry, SARS-CoV-2 virus as it had been identified in 2019 as being the responsible virus for the current COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, in general, coronaviruses are a large family of respiratory viruses that include COVID-19's MERS and SARS, but we're focusing more on the SARS as it's the severe acute respiratory syndrome. Uh, this respiratory illness had rapidly spread all around the world, uh, resulting in significant health and economic uh, impact. Uh, there are numerous uh, considerations effectively to effectively managing COVID-19. However, one of the main focuses is the central idea of a community. And when we're talking about the central idea of a community, we're not talking about mostly the economical definition of a community. We're talking about the ecological and the public health definition as well of a community by sharing, aw sharing awareness uh, through education programs, education outreach, to prevent mostly and to create prevention plan through policies, vaccinations, and uh, social distancing. And mostly when we talk about vaccinations, we have one of the barriers, which is managing misinformation to create social support and mostly to foster new health norms and enlisting existing norms, which is in the end, it's gonna give us an outcome of creating a resilience community and the self-efficacy. We adapted methods such as PCR, RNA extraction, surveys, and mostly in the lab, we worked on RNA isolations. After we get the samples, we isolate the samples and we can pick two paths, whether after inactivations, of course, we can go through extractions or direct inactivations with no extractions. And after we transfer it to the plate, we go through RNA, CDN RNA, and we can get amplification and detection and paracoding and sequencing. And it's important because uh, synthetic DNA is mostly transcripted through specific messenger RNA through a specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And we think it's important because once we are able to identify these like variants and sequencing, we can share these variants as Maddie mentioned in her presentation through not only a national database, but also an international database. And I'm going to pass it now the presentation to Boro. Hello. Um, over the long time, we were um, t receiving tests, and this is depicts on all through the just 2023 alone. So one of the issues we had was that we were receiving fewer and fewer tests. So you see in the earlier in the Earlier months, they were eating. They were eating. They were. We tend. These were just positive individuals, but one could give an idea that this is gives an idea how many people are testing. So in the early winter months, they were larger, and then they dropped off as we got into the into the spring and summer. Then they picked up again in September and October again. Uh, school began. Let's see. All right, that's what. All right. So we also took survey based on what was the was the frequency of positives based on the age. Um, in order to determine this, I checked how many patients were ha had their birthday at 
in the case of the 70 plus at or before December 31st, 1953. That would make them 70 years of age or turning 70 years before the, this year is out, over. So as you see, the 20 to 29 year olds had the most, had the highest by far positives. Um, what we can conclude, obviously, I, I mean, Gens is school, so we expect to say, face all off students, but it can also express how many, how exposed students of this age group are. We tend to be more careful with the seniors, of course, and then, but with students, I mean, we're still going to classes and still, and we're still passing by in halls, so that make, make them a little more vulnerable to catching any COVID-19 that may be spraying around the campus. And then we decided to look at the frequency of the symptoms based on the database. So now notice that each percentage is not saying this amount of percentage, uh, percentage of, of patients had just the cough alone. Often what we would find is a patient, we would ask a patient, okay, what type of symptoms are you having? and then we would list them out. And then we found, for, ex for example, I mean, 2.2% had, uh, was out of the 178 had vomiting. Unusual, okay, but I mean, we, we still recorded that. I mean, so one of these symptoms, let's say for cough, does that necessarily mean a person has COVID? No, absolutely not, not necessarily, but if suppose you had two symptoms, then you have a higher chance that the person has COVID. Three and then three or more, then you start to be more, sort of more to suspect COVID-19. So this will give us a better idea how to be able to track it within ourselves and then within our communities, within our families. Okay, in the end, we'll need further research to study new cases among different categories among race, gender, and other factors. The data we were provided, we could not get that because of HIPAA issues. And during the pandemic, social, hand, or social distancing, regular hands hygiene, and other safe practices are very effective at um, preventing the spread of COVID-19 and get, having more people infected. And we could use more research to better prevent any outbreak in general. Okay, and we have our resources if, if we like. Any questions? Oh, yes. Um, so when you were measuring people's symptoms and stuff, were you, um, were you taking into account any like other illnesses they may have had? Like, is cough or shortness of breath going to be worse if the patient has asthma, for example, that kind of stuff? I was not given access to that, but um, Maddie, might, um, Ms. Heater, might be able to answer that. When we do contact tracing, we do also ask if they're immunocompromised, either that be medically or um, just like medically would be Yes. Um, are there any uh, currently developing variants that you see uh, on the radar, so to speak? And if so, are the symptoms, um, I guess, similar to those of past variants? Mm -hmm. I can answer this question. So actually, me and Maddie, a couple of weeks ago, we identified a variant and it, we had to go through an international database to be able to identify it. It was probably 0.1% known, this variant, worldwide. Yes. How can disease truly affect people just on their race and gender and such? Maybe well, it, not, just. Uh, maybe not necessarily whether a person is uh, of a certain gender or race, but 
it might be more effective about where they live or how they, um, um, what socioeconomic status they are in. And Go ahead. Yeah, and, and, and mostly we're looking at the resources that are available and also there is a cultural literacy and health literacy. So we want to make sure people from all over the world, they have the same resources that it's basically aligned with whatever they believe in. Oh, yes. How well do you think your data exemplifies Erie as a whole or do you think it's somewhat artificial for Canon-specific. Do you have any other institutions like CBS or anything you get data from? I don't know if they're still testing. Mm -hmm. um, yes, this was, we received data from both um, our campus and as well as the Gannon campus down in Ruskin, Florida. So mostly this is students, so this is mostly um, the university, but we also receive every once in a while some folks for, for in the community. But um, Maddie, I think yeah, might have some. Yeah, we indicate those communities. So it's a snapshot of a very, very specific population, which makes it hard because I think you can't really say that. I know you can't say that it's the community or your community as a whole because if we're only looking at student um, age population, people who are on the campus, yeah, they travel into the community. Some of them may be a part of the community, but again, it's people who are specific to Gannon University, so. That's why more community tests can help out. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, everybody. This does conclude this session. Um, we are going to take a break until about 3.30, which uh, we will have the presentation of the Jerry Covert Student Research Awards. So please stick around for that. Thank you.
Yeah.
y'all.
39 oral presentations, 53 poster presentations, which I think is right about our record. Um, and Alzi actually started years before I was on board, and Dr. Covert was the one that really made this all happen, laid the foundation and groundwork for everything, and really, really valued student research and this symposium. So um, we will have him presenting the awards. <laughs> So our first place, and if you are here, please come up and accept the award. And if you're not, hopefully you're watching on the live stream, and then you can come at a later time and pick it up. But our first place undergraduate poster award is to Jordan Krauss for the effect of zooplankton on the health of Presque Isle Bay and Lake Pleasant from Gannon University. Our first place graduate poster award is Abigail Steinbeck from LeCom for the Cyano Architecture of the Superior, all the very complex of the domestic cat. <laughs> all right, now to the oral presentations. Second place undergraduate oral presentation is Kara Hill from Mercyhurst University. <laughs> Our first place undergraduate oral presentation is Hallie Altadonna from Penn State Erie for the effects of selfing and outcrossing on transgenerational responses to predation risks. I'm so excited to have people here accept their awards. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so for the graduate oral presentation, second place. Zachary Breeden from LeCom, the effects of repeated intranasal administration of genomycin on vestibular functions. <laughs> and finally, our first place graduate oral presentation goes to Jonathan Townsend from University of Buffalo, Habitat Suitability Mapping Using Logistic Regression Analysis of Long-Term Bioacoustical Fat Survey Data Analysis in Cascadia Creek Watershed. Congratulations. <laughs> professors, especially the students, graduate, undergraduate students, the judges, thank you to the judges. Um, they put in a lot of hard work to judge 53 poster presentations and 39 oral presentations. So if we could just give a round of applause to the judges. <laughs> Holly Best and the PADCNR staff um, for all their preparations here at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. I'd like to thank Make It Fabulous Catering for the wonderful food and also the Sam and Frank Band who was here last night that always makes our socials a lot of fun. Um, I'd like to thank Eric Dye over there for technological support and live streaming. So anytime we have that moment of panic, he just comes over and fixes it, which is fantastic. Um, and then I need to thank my staff who made this, uh, the whole thing possible. So, Jen Salem, Sean Dalton, Sarah Baggett, I'm sorry, they just make me feel terrible. All right. <laughs> 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 Terribly emotional. <laughs> because they worked so hard, and this year I had to step away at the beginning of the conference. I couldn't even open it up, and I was like, it's official now. I can hand it over. They can make it happen, and they don't need me anymore, so. Thank you. <laughs> that concludes our symposium. So please mark your calendars next year. It will be November 6th, 7th, and 8th of 2024. See you then. Thank you.